A good Tuesday morning to you. It is August 24th. Jesperson here with Hoyles and Brooks. A great show coming up. The show's going to move fast, as a matter of fact. We're going to be talking about Afghanistan. We're going to continue our coverage of the federal election. Canadians will be voting, you know, September 20th. We're going to talk to, uh, we're taking a different angle on this. A different angle every day. Don't, don't add us if you don't like what we're talking about that day when it comes to the federal election. Because the next day, we're going to be talking about something else. We're going to talk to the only NDP member of parliament on the prairies. I mean, technically right now, we're not referring to them as members of parliament. Just like Justin Trudeau's not the prime minister, he's liberal leader Justin Trudeau. Heather McPherson is the NDP candidate in Edmonton, Strathcona. She's been on an island of orange for the past couple of years. We're going to pick her brain from her perspective. A lot of you were in touch with us yesterday, quite rightfully so, saying, you know, you spent a lot of time talking about the conservatives and the liberals, and then you kind of threw some piecemeal questions together at the end about the NDP and the Greens. We said, ah, just wait. Just wait. The conversations will continue. That includes today. Why is Alberta leading the country when it comes to pregnancy and COVID-19 cases? Why is it so troubling? We'll find out. Plus, author Seth Klein, does it make sense to compare the climate war or the approach to it to how Canada or the Allied forces approached World War II. We'll dig into that today. Plus, our Y Station question of the week. First, we'll remind you that this show is presented by our good friends at Bitcoin Well, the world's first, literally the first in the world, publicly traded Bitcoin ATM company, providing advice as well as reputable, reliable buying and selling services for crypto, plus a whole lot more. If you're trying to figure out what this is all about, maybe the cool kids are talking about crypto and then, and then you hear some other people taking shots at it and you want to know what's the truth, you got some pretty direct questions. Those are their favorite ones. You'll find Bitcoin well under the sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Paralympic opening ceremony today in front of, of course, an empty stadium in, in Tokyo. Same deal as the Olympic Games just a few weeks ago. It's, it feels like they kind of came and gone. They've, they've, they've come and gone in a flash, and now it's the Paralympics. And I know that there's a bunch of people that feel like these events should run concurrently. Like it should just be one big event. And, and we're going to be paying some attention to some interesting storylines uh, some Canadian athletes included, some Canadian Paralympians in uh, the next couple of weeks or so. But wanted to remind you that our Y Station question of the week, the results are coming up a little bit later on in this show. You told us how you feel about the Olympic Games. I also wanted to remind you that if you go to our website right now, RyanJesperson.com, you will find our new question of the week ready and waiting for you. To no one's surprise, a federal election has been called. It's coming up September 20th. As you know, we want Real Talkers predictions for the outcome, reactions to the writ drop, as well as your voting intention. As we warned you yesterday, we're, we're, we're going to get a little bit rude. We're going to ask you the questions you're not supposed to ask people. A little spicy? A Sex, little... religion, and politics. That's right. So we picked one for this question of the week. I was talking to Chris Henderson, the team at Y Station. I thought, well, maybe maybe we could ask two or three rude questions. We could ask people about sex, religion, and politics all at once, just blow up the dinner table. But instead, we're going to ask you about voting intention. I think it's going to provide us, we're going to leave this one open for two weeks. It's going to provide us some interesting insight into where real talkers are at, uh, first of all, and second of all, the issues that matter to people. And of course, one of the big reasons why it's so important to us that you participate in this question of the week it gives us a sense of what's important to you. It gives us a sense of if we're going to say to you, we're going to carry on daily discussions about election issues that matter. We don't want to speculate about that. We want to have good intel. We want to have good information, feedback from you. Let's call you our editorial partners on this. You are associate producers on this. So we encourage you to check out our question of the week. It'll take you literally three minutes to fill out. Again, the link is right at the top of the page at RyanJesperson.com. We'll talk about Afghanistan in just a moment. Uh, an excellent guest joining us from McGill University, Sophia Amory, is going to join us. Uh, she was born in Afghanistan. She started her primary education there in, in secret, as a matter of fact, under Taliban regime. And she's still got a whole bunch of family 
over there. I'm looking forward to that conversation. I know it's going to be a personal one. I wanted to get to a letter first. This is an email we received just the other day to talk at ryanjesperson.com. This is from Jillian. Jillian wrote in after she heard that we were going to be talking about COVID-19 and pregnancies. She said, I'm, I'm so happy to hear you're going to be talking about how COVID's been so dangerous for expectant mothers. Jillian says, I gave birth in June. Congratulations. She says, and I was very lucky to get my first COVID shot whilst pregnant. I remember being so worried, waiting for my turn to be eligible. Data was already out from Israel that pregnant women who received a COVID vaccine not only fared very well, but they also pass along the COVID antibodies to their fetus in the womb and also through breast milk. Jillian says, I only really knew all this because I, I particularly looked. I paid specific attention to articles relating to pregnancy and COVID. Typically what, what expectant people tend to do. Pay a lot closer attention to these types of things. Jillian says, although it seemed like pregnant women across the world were dying in disproportionate numbers from the beginning of this pandemic, very little attention was being given to this story. Not enough warnings were going out to pregnant women to get vaccinated. And here she goes, pedal to the metal. She says, so on to pregnant people. You could probably do a whole show on why women like me are now being referred to as pregnant people or vulva carriers or bleeders or menstruators or non-men while men are not being referred to as penis carriers or, yeah, by the way, kids, earmuffs, breakfast. <laughs> Although, you know what? Hey, this is science. This is science. You can talk about this. Yeah. We, we, we have one or the other. Uh why men are not being referred to as penis carriers or testicle holders or ejaculators or prostate owners for the sake of inclusion, says Jillian. But that's an entirely different show. Why pregnant people pisses me off is, is simply because we're not people. We're not treated like people or equal in any way when it comes to medicine. We never were, she says, and that matters. The issue of pregnant women dying disproportionately from COVID has not been given enough media attention, specifically because we are women. Folks would have cared more if we were people. From vehicle safety being designed for men's bodies like we've heard about on Real Talk to drugs being tested on men that administered to women without specific testing for us like we've heard about on Real Talk to probably the biggest slap in the face, birth control approved for our use that causes blood clots at a much higher rate than a vaccine that governments have decided to shun. You wouldn't do that to people, but you can get away with doing such things to women. It matters that we are women and it matters that we're referred to as such because it completely impacts how we are treated in medicine and science. We are discounted. We are not listened to. We are an afterthought. Jillian says it took decades for the medical field to recognize that postpartum depression was real. Serena Williams famously saved her own life after giving birth by walking herself to the operating room when she felt like something was wrong and she wasn't being listened to. We women are being let down, so media should not call us people because you wouldn't do this to people. Jeez, if only we were really pregnant people, more of us may have survived COVID. She says, I'm writing to thank Real Talk for taking on the issue of COVID and pregnancy. You will save lives. That from Jillian, a new mom. It's powerful stuff. Wanted to set the scene for that. That conversation is coming up in about 35, 40 minutes from now. Before we move on to our lead interview this morning, this, of course, is the international story that is grabbing everybody's attention, or at least in, in varying degrees, like we talked about a little bit with David Hurley yesterday. I want to remind you about something exciting coming up in Edmonton. The Edmonton Symphony Orchestra is back together for the first time in a year and a half, in its entirety. Since March of 2020, the ESO is thrilled to announce the return of Symphony Under the Sky, which is taking place in William Horlack Park from August 26th, that's just a couple of days from now, through till September 5th. You can expect imaginative performances suitable for all audiences. You wanna take mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, ready to get outside and spend some time outdoors? How about the kids? What a perfect time to introduce them to symphonic sound. Everything from the classical gems, the Hollywood hits that everybody would recognize, and of course, Tchaikovsky's famed 1812 Overture. 
There's distanced seating options. And what's really cool as well, there's grass seating. If you've been to Horlock Park, you know what I'm talking about. Seating on that grassy hill is absolutely free for kids 17 and under accompanied by an adult. Tickets start at $20 and you can find out more at windspearcenter.com. Well, the eyes of the world are on Afghanistan right now. Obviously, people are appalled at what we see happening at the Kabul airport as well as across the country now under Taliban rule. Our leadoff guest this morning, Sophia Amory, is currently a Ph.D. candidate in the Department of Integrated Studies and Education to focus on women and gender studies at McGill University. She's from Afghanistan, started her primary education there during the previous Taliban regime. Sophia, thank you so much for making time for us and a good morning to you. Welcome to Real Talk. Good morning to you too, Ryan, and thank you for having me. How do I begin this interview other than asking you your personal feelings about what's happening right now in your country of origin? You still have a whole bunch of family over there. How are you doing right now? I am trying to stay strong. Um, It's not for myself, for my family right now because they need help. They are in the country. And if I fall apart here, um, uh, there is... Like, like I am literally their source of strength at the moment. And if I'm not doing well, definitely they would, um, they would fall apart there too. And the situation is chaotic, as you know. And yes, uh, this is personal. There are moments that um, um, I do fall apart, but I'm trying to put myself back together, put my pieces back together, and then stay strong and work um, uh, to help uh, the country and the people and what I can do in my capacity right now. Mm. There are, uh, of course, understandings here, I think, on behalf of, of, of international observers who can we try to wrap our mind around some of the complexities here. And then there are things that none of us probably could ever understand. I was reading up just yesterday on phone cards and how people are having a hard time recharging their phone cards and how devastating that is for people to be losing contact. Have you, at the very least, been able to stay in contact with your family? Um, so far, yes. Um, I, I managed to, um, uh, to stay in contact with them. And one of the things that we did was to, yes, get enough, um, credit card for them at the time uh, for to refill their um, phones so we can be in contact. Um, the internet connection is super slow because most of the telecommunication um, um, offices and agencies are closed and um, uh, a lot of people are trying to reach out around and um, um, that that's not very helpful, but at least I can get through uh, to them through their phones. Um, and, um, yeah, um, it's, it, it's, the, it, it's not easy, uh, especially if you cannot reach them given the current situation. Uh, but so far we managed to stay in contact and I'm scared of that day if I wouldn't be able to reach them. Sophia, would you provide some, some insight for our audience in, into what it was like, uh, being raised uh, in Afghanistan under the previous Taliban regime for people that would have no frame of reference, people that have grown up under a for the most part, stable democracy that are, that are trying to understand the implications of what's happening right now. Can you put it into terms we can understand? Uh, definitely. Um, I was, I was a kid at the time. I, um, my memory is very vague, but I do remember a lot of, a lot of things for sure. Um, I was supposed to start school that year, um, the, the first grade. Um, but, um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't go to school, uh, because Taliban came and they uh, banned school for girls. Um, they banned girls' education, women. Uh, as as um, I'm sure you read or, or you heard about it, women's basic human rights were denied at the time. Um, so for me, uh, it was complicated to comprehend that at the time. I was a kid and I was um, always um, asking my parents that, what is happening? Why I cannot go to school? I want to go to school because I was so excited. I had my backpacks and my uniform and everything ready, but they had hard time to made me understand that why, why I cannot go to school, because it, it's so hard to talk to a five, six year old child to say that why you cannot go to school. Um, but at the same time, um, then um, other things started like um, uh, coming to our lives. We were supposed to uh, bury or put away all the pictures or photos that we had at home. And it was hard to comprehend. We had to remove our TV. We had to, um, I, I, was, I was a little kid, but I had to cover up, like they had to put a scarf on my head when we were going out. Um, 
the women were not uh, able to go out without a male companion from a close relative, which is a son, a husband, um, a brother. Um, so yes, life has changed a lot for people. And um, um, I, I still do remember um, that how, uh, for me as a person, I lost that childhood. I didn't experience what being a child was at the time, because I was supposed to act like an adult, like an adult woman. And I was supposed to, I didn't have the chance to play. I didn't have the chance to go to school. I didn't have the chance to, to get a normal education. How much of your early upbringing and, and your childhood experience uh, in Afghanistan impacted your PhD studies now? I mean, is, is there a direct correlation between your early upbringing and and your studies now in education and with, with a focus on women and gender studies? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, because um, for me growing up as a child and uh, um, um, the difficulties I went through um, and my family went through to a good education um, uh, uh, shaped, my, shaped my journey to, um, uh, to, uh, to work um, and um, also read out my studies towards women and gender um, and also education. Um, uh, I didn't know at the time that what does it mean to send your daughter to a, a secret or hidden uh, school. Uh, but um, interesting point was that I was, um, I was wrapped up in a big uh, headscarf uh, or burqa, um, which was literally also acting as a shield for me to hide my books that also includes an English book. And if the Taliban knew that I am having books, I'm going to school and I'm also holding an English book. So I'm studying a little bit of here and there English. So they would have killed me and my family right away. So I didn't know at the time I was a kid, but finally my family did risk their lives. And when um, I grew up and I understood the severity of the situation and what my family went through to make that decision to send me to school, I, I realized how important education is. Then I started working to help Afghan kids get education, Afghan women get education. And also I rerouted my education journey towards women and gender studies and education. Mm. Uh, current uh, Taliban leadership is, is claiming that it's going to allow uh, women to work and it's going to allow girls to go to school. Do you believe that one bit? I do not believe in that um, because um, this is exactly what they did last time. They said we will allow women um, to have their rights based on Sharia law and their expectation and their understanding of Sharia law is way different than I understand Islam, I believe. Um, and I do not, we Afghans do not uh, know the Islam that the Taliban is um, um, uh, introducing to people. Uh, so um, um, they even right now that they are claiming that they will leave, let women to go to school or work, but as far as they obey the Sharia law, or it should be uh, based on the Sharia law or Islamic law, um, they closed the universities for girls already in the cities that um, and they uh, it's under their control, and now of course the whole country. So women in Afghanistan is right now um, at home. They cannot get out again the same way without a male companion. They were sent back home from the universities and schools. Um, and they asked women who were uh, working um, to stay home until they make a decision. But this was exactly like last time. They said that we will get back to you. And then they said that no, women cannot work. And this will... The history will definitely repeat itself. And we, are, we already started experiencing that. We can see that what what they already started. Sophia, the the uh, I mean, I mean, there, I think it's fair to say that there are uh, very serious and pressing short term concerns for for the safety of uh, Afghan citizens. Uh, in particular, I think those that have assisted international agencies, uh, including Canadians, their diplomats, troops, and the like. Of course, there are fear. Fears, very real fears that executions will occur. I know that many people are trying to destroy evidence of any participation or cooperation uh, with other countries. And then, of course, there are the longer term realities, the very real concerns, some of them that you're dictating right now. When you talk to your family members or when you talk to other contacts there on the ground in Afghanistan right now, what sense are they giving you about what's actually happening? What does their experience look like? 
there is a sense of fear and hopelessness in Afghanistan right now. Um, that including my family. Um, um, definitely people are um, uh, fearing for their lives, especially those who were involved somehow with uh, women in human rights advocacy, people who are journalists or working with media, minority groups, women for sure, like women is on the top of the list, um, and people who work um, for the government, uh, the previous government, I would say. And I, I do not call Taliban a government. I, I need to correct that um, for the Afghan government. Um, so uh, basically, um, uh, Taliban already started door-to-door uh, um, -door manhunt to go after the people um, that they think worked with uh, foreign nationals, uh, those who I already mentioned, the categories. Um, um, they, they are, they're already after them, and people are um, uh, fearing their lives. They don't know how long they can hide, where they can hide, and um, when would be the day that Taliban will get to them. What would appropriate or meaningful or effective international involvement look like? I know it's it's been difficult to see aircraft at the Kabul airport. Uh, I, I mean, swarmed by people who are desperate to save their lives. People trying to scale barbed wire fences, trying to get onto the tarmac. I mean, people have lost their lives trying to get up into the fuselage, trying to get up into the aircraft. Uh, in, in a desperate attempt uh, to, to to breathe another breath. I mean, this, it doesn't get any more serious. It doesn't get any more real than this. We take a look at the, the evacuations. We take a look at, at, at American and British and Canadian and other citizens uh, that, that have been transported out of Kabul. But of course, that that doesn't really say anything aside from commitments from some governments about Afghan citizens that also many people believe very strongly need to be protected quite literally to have their lives preserved what would international action meaningful action look like um aside from some involvement uh, from international community in afghanistan right now it's really sad to see that the world is watching afghanistan in silence um they um i think um the world uh, let afghanistan down one more time um i would say um um, for now, um, yes, all we need is we are already here in this situation. So what this happened, um, but what we can do right now is to save those lives that they are mostly at risk. All Afghans are at risk for sure, but there are um, certain groups that they are they have high priority. In this timeline that it is set, the 30th of August for international troops to be evacuated is um, not uh, not enough for everyone to have a safe passage especially given uh, the situation in Kabul airport right now and um, the way uh, people are um, accessing the airport. Um, so um, uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was very devastating for me um, that I had a talk with um, someone uh, yesterday, actually, um, who was coming from a minority group and who received uh, papers from Canadian government because he was involved with some Canadian projects to leave the country. He has valid papers to get out of the country, but he cannot get to the airport. And because he was coming from an ethnic minority, uh, being Hazara, he was tortured on the way to the airport by Taliban. Um, and he, uh, his phone was taken away. And he, was, uh, he said that they made a mockery of him and um, he saw his own life and his uh, child's life address. He saw him, he showed me his, his bruises that um, uh, he, he, he did two attempts to get to the airport and he couldn't. And that's what he came back with, a bunch of bruises back home and uh, hopeless and desperate. Sophia Amory is our guest, uh, a researcher, a PhD candidate out of McGill University. Trevor is watching us this morning live on YouTube. And he says, I just don't. And, and I think Trevor speaks for millions of people. He says, I, I just don't understand how international troops, how these allies were in Afghanistan for so long, uh, in part supposedly training security forces, and then the Taliban just takes over so quickly. I've seen other commentary, inclu including from journalists who spent time over in Afghanistan that have been encouraging people to reach out uh, to Canadian, American, and, and British servicemen and women that spent time over there, many of them that lost uh, close colleagues or friends in, in sacrifice, in service, wondering what on earth was the last 15 years 
all about. How did this happen so quickly? With your understanding of Afghanistan and with your intuition, are you able to explain to us how you think this all came about? Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Trevor. That's, that's, that's a great question. I would say that we do not understand, uh, as, as you mentioned, too, that how can a country can fall into Taliban's hand in one night, overnight. Like the next morning, your hopes and dreams are shattered. Um, no one would, no one have expected that, uh, and no one was ready for it. Um, so um, this is this is the question that um, what the international community were doing in the past uh, 15 years or 20 years in the country, um, while we are still where we are right now, while we experienced exactly what we experienced um, in 1996 uh, to 2001. So. Um, uh, Basically, and, 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 and what happened that Afghanistan fall into a terrorist group overnight? So um, I, I would say that there are, are uh, bigger games in play. And uh, given Afghanistan's strategic um, position, um, I would say uh, um, geographically, um, a lot of countries are interested one way or the other. And um, um, I do not want to get into politics. But there is, I, I would say there is something uh, way bigger um, behind the pictures that we cannot see. Um, otherwise, um, like it, you can't even imagine that a country, even if the weakest country, would fall into a terrorist group's um, hands overnight. Sophia, do you uh, have hope for your country of origin? Do you have hope? For Afghanistan, I mean, would you would you like to see your family members there be able to thrive and experience freedom of of, of religion, of education, of opportunity, or do you just want to get them out of there? I mean, ultimately, where's your heart at? Not right now. Um, I was I was still hopeful a month ago. Hmm. I was still thinking that there is a way out of this, but not uh, not at the moment. Um, not with what happened. Um, um, my, my only concern is to, uh, yes, for sure, my family, get my family to safety uh, somehow, which um, I'm, I'm, I'm working so hard and um, so far there is uh, not very much tangible result. Um, but also I do not see my family thriving there or any of Afghans and especially Afghan women, because we know who Taliban are. We know what they did before to women, and they will continue doing that. And even worse, they are even smarter today. They know how to manipulate the narrative and come to the media and all like do all the sweet talks. But behind the scene, they are doing way worse. I'm sure that you already heard about um, they flocking women uh, who are out alone without a male companion. They are. Um, they went. They are taking women as sex slaves. They are. Um, they are. They burned a woman for not feeding them properly and not cooking properly, and a lot of other atrocities that are, that has already started. So at the moment, um, with what is going on and the way everything is unfolding, uh, there is no hope. Um, it, it's. Um, I, I. I. do not. Um, I, I. I. I don't know what will happen to the future. But in the near future, um, not really. Sophia, I just want to absolutely sincerely thank you for your candor this morning. I can't imagine uh, where you must be at mentally, emotionally right now with your family. We wish them a safe scenario and wish you all the best. And thank you so much for talking to us today. This has provided a very real and clear picture of what life is like over there right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. That's Sophia Amory, who's a, a researcher and a Ph.D. candidate at McGill University. We have these moments uh, when, when you conduct interviews, when you do a show like this that's now going to move and talk about the federal election. And then we're going to talk about, you know, the, you know, uh, the covid and then we're going to talk about the Olympics and we're going to talk about the environment. I mean, geez, the, the pretty heavy pillars this morning, but still. How do you just move on from that? Lisa says, watching right now live, I can't imagine living through the situation in Afghanistan. It's truly terrifying. It is terrifying. Terry says we really won a birth lottery, didn't we? 
born in Canada. We can't even we can't even imagine. We can't fathom what other families face to just simply exist. I saw Fatima chiming in, uh, said this is just the bastardization of a religion. You know, what a clear picture. You know, when she says she she, she wear, I think she said a burqa, if I remember correctly, or at least a head covering, um, covering up books because she's a girl covering up an English book for fear of being killed. I mean, how much more real does it get than that? We'll continue to cover this story. And of course, we're always curious to know where you're at with this. If you find a way to put it into words, you can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We'll transition to talk about the federal election in just a moment. Right now, I wanted to let you know that the team at Westworld Computers... They've outfitted our studio with everything we need to bring you this show every day, and they've just kicked off their Back to the Future school and work sale. When you buy a new Mac with Apple Care Plus at Westworld, they're going to give you up to $100 to spend on awesome accessories. Or if a new iPad Pro with Apple Care Plus is on the shopping list, then you'll receive $50 in instant savings on accessories and don't forget you can save hundreds when you trade up from your current mac or ipad you can find out more at westworld.ca you can shop online you can book your service appointments there nice and easy to use also a reminder that the team at eden landscaping still hard at work getting those summer projects done before they'll transition back into the design work that they do through the winter months working with clients to bring outdoor spaces to life So, right now you're looking outside, you can picture a gazebo or a bigger deck or an entertaining space or a walkway. It's never too late in the season to make contact with the team at Eden Landscaping. You'll find Mike and his team online at landscapeedmonton.ca. I know I don't have to tell this engaged audience that the federal election is coming up in uh, just over three weeks on September 20th. And we will continue to bring you daily discussions On different angles of that federal election yesterday, it was David Hurley, uh, the podcaster behind the Hurley Burley that talked to us about why he thinks Justin Trudeau is losing ground in Ontario to the conservatives, why he thinks the Greens just aren't even running a campaign at all, and why he thinks that the NDP might have a fighting chance in some writings where some of us may have written them off. If anybody knows about fighting chances, it is the only NDP member of parliament in the entire province of Alberta. She'll probably clarify and remind me that across the prairies, that's the reality for Heather McPherson, who's represented her constituents in the riding of Edmonton Strathcona for the past couple of years, making her Real Talk debut this morning. Welcome to the show. It's good to see you. Nice to see you as well, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Let me throw you a fastball right out of the gates. We've just had a, 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 a conversation that's almost floored me uh, with Sophia Amory, who's talking about foreign policy. She's talking about the reality on the ground in Afghanistan right now. Hurley, yesterday, David Hurley says to me, he conducted a focus group, 10 people, 90 minutes. He talked to 10 undecided voters, said the word Afghanistan didn't come up even once you've been knocking on doors i know for weeks now is this something that's on people's radar does foreign policy factor into an election platform as far as you can tell first of all i want to just say that the interview you just had was was it's hard to hear i mean that that is some hard stuff to have to 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 hear and to know that these people are going through this right now we are hearing it on the doorsteps i've been hearing it from folks Um, You know, we've been door knocking across the constituency. I've been helping out with some of our candidates and other constituencies, and we have been hearing this. And I'm somebody who comes from a background in international development and foreign affairs. And so I'm not, um, I wouldn't say foreign affairs is a typical, you know, election issue, something that you hear very often, but we are hearing it on the doorsteps. It is something that Canadians should be and are concerned about. You know, we've got We've got service women and men that that worked in Afghanistan, that worked with these people. I, I work in international development, or I have, and and you know we have trained some of these these folks to be judges, to be doctors, to be teachers, and they are now in danger. Uh, and we're not doing near enough to make sure that they're getting out, to make sure that they're staying safe. It's um, it's something I wrote to the minister in February to say that this exact scenario was going to happen. None of this came out of the blue. And I, I mean, 
it's an emergency. This is non-political. Let's get these people out. Uh, I remember you and I spoke shortly after you were elected in October of 2019. And I, I don't know if you would prefer the phrase kingmaker or not, but a lot of people believe that the NDP could play a really big role with the minority liberal government in, in making sure that some policy that would be a priority for new Democrats might happen. I know that Pharmacare was a big part of that discussion. Your party's leader, Jagmeet Singh, has recently described this as Justin Trudeau's selfish summer election you think that canadians are convinced that we should be going to the polls in september no i mean there is no reason for this election except that justin trudeau is really trying for his majority i mean that's why we're going to the polls in a fourth wave of a pandemic uh parliament was working well you know i'm the deputy house leader i was sitting at those tables um i was part of those negotiations i i know how well parliament was working this is a this is a power grab that the prime minister is is taking and hoping that he can he can cash in on on maybe some voter apathy, maybe some people that are busy with summer trying to get over COVID. And I think, I mean, when I'm at the doorsteps, people are not interested in going to an election right now. Uh, Heather, it was, uh, I, I know, a tough election uh, for your party in 2019. Didn't fare as well as you wanted, losing 15 of the 39 seats that, mm-hmm. that you had. I want to play a clip from my interview yesterday with David Hurley and get your assessment. Uh, he actually, uh, well... I'm going to let it speak for itself. We'll play it, and I'll get you to respond. Here's David Hurley from Real Talk yesterday. You shouldn't dismiss the NDP. People, Canadians love Jagmeet Singh. Canadians think Jagmeet Singh's great um, and uh, easily the most popular of the leaders. And among young people under the age of 35, his favorables are through the roof. And they are having a little trouble turning all that goodwill, goodwill into votes right now. Uh, But it's only one week into the campaign. I don't write them off at all. And they're a real threat to the liberals if they are able to grow their support in any significant way. Because as the conservatives grow, it puts even more pressure on the liberals to collapse the NDP vote. So I don't think they're fringe. I think they're players in B.C. I think they're players in parts of Ontario. I think they're players in parts of Atlanta, Canada. And uh, and they have they have growth potential. So not fringe, but having a hard time turning goodwill into votes. How do you do it? Well, you know, I think we've always, of course, had some really strong support in Edmonton, some really strong support in in Edmonton, Strathcona, of course. But I'm seeing an incredible shift, really. I mean, Jagmeet's been to Alberta twice this campaign. He has been over in Griesbaugh because I'm I'm almost positive that that Griesbaugh will be able to shift to an NDP seat. You know, thank goodness we've had we've had incredible MLAs over there that have been fighting so hard for us. And we've got an MP there right now that frankly doesn't live in the community and hasn't done his job. So so knowing that the, the Blake Desjardins is going to be um, our MP in Griesbaugh is awesome. I mean, he is the most Jagmeet Singh is the most popular federal leader in Alberta right now. Uh, I think Albertans are looking at what they saw within the Liberal government, where we have seen, you know, over and over again, the the promises being made, whether that's on climate change or truth and reconciliation or, you know, all of these things. And they haven't actually followed through and actually delivered. And then, frankly, the, the Conservative Party has very little to offer Albertans right now. You know, this idea that they are looking out for you. Ryan, I've been in that House of Commons. There is... There is literally, it is a nonstop, it, this is your fault, this is your fault. You know, where is the where is the winner there for Canadians? Where's the winner there for Alberta? If you want to win here, though, and if you want to keep your seat here, you sometimes have to stray away from the party's positions, right? Like, you think about the Trans Mountain Pipeline Absolutely. expansion. That's something that you've had to support, or at least you felt compelled mm-hmm. to support. How does that fly when it goes to your colleagues in in parliament and 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 how difficult is it i mean take us through a a miles long walk through the shoes of an ndp member of parliament on the prairies so yeah i mean it's a it's a it's a lonely business out here right now like you said i'm the only one between sort of winnipeg and the rocky mountains um but i also feel like i'm also the only one that is prepared to push back against some of the things that we're seeing from our from our conservative premier. I'm the only one, you know, that's fighting for the Rocky Mountains for coal, that's pushing back on making sure our healthcare stays, you know, universally accessible, publicly delivered. Um, you know, some of those things are really important to Albertans. And so I will keep fighting for them. And and I'm not, I mean, 
it's election season, so we're all very adversarial. I'll work with anybody if they are working for the benefit of Albertans. I have I've got a long history of working with my colleagues in both parties, both of the conservative and the liberal parties, um, if they're pulling the right direction. But I have no problem at all fighting for Alberta. And if that means sometimes, you know, I disagree with some of my colleagues, if that means I disagree with some of the things that are going on across the country, it's a big country. We're not going to agree on everything. Um, My job is to fight for Edmonton Strathcona residents and for Albertans, and I'm just going to keep on doing that. Chelsea's watching live right now on YouTube. She says leader and platform are two different things, right? The most popular leader doesn't necessarily equal the most popular platform. She's right there. Alyssa, Mm -hmm. with a direct question, you're probably getting this at the doors. She says liberals got us through the pandemic. Where was the NDP? What would you say to her? Well, honestly, the liberals did not get us through the pandemic. If we had not had a minority government, this would have been a very different response to the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, it was clearly, we've got the receipts, Ryan. It was the NDP that made sure we had served, that we had that available for people who needed it, for the wage subsidy, um, you know, supports for seniors and people living with disabilities, the students. I mean, how many times have we stood up in the House of Commons and talked about the support we need to get for students? It was my unanimous consent motion, actually, that got $2 billion out to schools across the country in August last year to make sure it was safer for people to, for students to go back to school. We, we've got to do more because we're not seeing the, the protections be put in place by our provincial government. But, but the response to COVID would have been 100% different if we had had a mi- majority government. A minority government with the NDP holding the balance of power is the best thing for Canadians. Uh, we don't have obviously enough time to dig into the entire platform, but there are some highlights. Anytime, like, Ryan, I'll uh, dig in anytime. <laughs> sure. I want to, <laughs> well, I want to touch on a couple with you. Your party's reiterated its commitment to a national pharmacare plan. Your party's reiterated its support for, or its commitment to $10 a day childcare. And in some provinces, there appears to be an appetite for that. And in some provinces, the, the liberals have deals in place. Alberta has been very clear mm-hmm. under premier Kenny's leadership that there's no appetite for a national pharmacare plan. And they they don't want to have the terms of a child care plan dictated to them. How would you and how would your party work with provincial governments that maybe don't see eye to eye on policy like the ones I've mentioned? Well, I, I mean, I will say it is very difficult for us to work with this current government in Alberta. You know, I'm looking at things like Campus St. Jean, where the government is the federal government has now come back with a 95 percent match and they are asking the, the provincial government to 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 pony up with five percent and and we still haven't heard from the premier on this um you know you're looking at things like child care and and what i see is i see premiers across the country whether they're conservative or not that are agreeing to this because it is the smartest thing for an economic recovery for our country uh jason kenny is going to have to come to the table i mean albertans are not going to tolerate it i i hate that in alberta right now if we want something changed we have to protest we have to we have to put up lawn signs we have to do all of these things just to get the the government to write the, make the right decisions but but if that's what has to happen that's what we'll continue to do because child care is the number one thing that we can do to have an economic recovery after COVID-19. You know, one of the things that's really jumped out from the NDP platform to me is a promise, a vow to dismantle far-right extremist organizations. How do you do it? There's a lot of ways you do it. First of all, you work with the communities that are impacted. I mean, it breaks my heart that the women in Edmonton, Strathcona, across Edmonton, across Alberta, but but a lot of instances in Edmonton, Strathcona, the women have been attacked for their faith, for 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 what they look like, for what they're wearing. Um, so there's there's a lot of ways that you can do it. First of all, we need to we need to look at online hate online. That is that is where. Uh, people are being radicalized. That is where these movements are able to grow. We need to name the white supremacy groups that are doing this and we need to call them out, make it, make it, um, you know, a dire punishment for that. But we need to also be listening. I mean, Muslim women have been bearing the brunt of this. We need to be talking to Muslim women. We need to be talking to Muslim women groups and hearing from them what those solutions, what those solutions look like. And, and, you know, we've started that process. There's still lots to do. Um, my worry, of course, is that that sometimes there is very superficial changes made to the federal government. and It doesn't actually get to what needs to happen to make fundamental systemic change. 
Heather, let me ask you this in closing. I, I've seen messaging in my riding uh, where there's a bit of a horse race right now. Uh, a conservative member of parliament. It was held by a liberal member of parliament before that. I'm talking about Edmonton Center. Lori Hahn's been the MP. Mm-hmm. Randy Boissonneau's been the MP. James Cumming is the MP. Now, the liberal messaging, Randy Boissonneau's messaging right now is we cannot afford to split the vote. He's taking aim at the NDP more than he's taking aim at the conservatives. How much of a problem is that for your party? Bigger picture. I mean, anyone who's ever voted in the Canadian election has heard the Liberals say over and over again that it's terrifying if we let a Conservative Party win. But I, but I do have to say, like, first of all, strategic voting never works. Um, it, it, it's never going to be something that is going to be that is going to guarantee who you want to get in. But second of all, frankly, you know, Heather McKenzie is a phenomenal candidate and she is just going up through the roof in the polls. So so realistically, the Conservatives aren't bringing much to the table right now. They're pulling at historic lows and and Randy is kind of fighting for his life. But I would uh, I would be betting on Heather McKenzie if I were folks in Edmonton Center. I told a tiny white lie. I, they say interviewers should never say last question because then you're going to get the real last question. <laughs> but this one has to be it because our bullpen is full right now and I've got an interview coming up. But this is a good point from Kim. Heather, I'm going to put my cards on the table and let you know that I don't actually know for a fact how many candidates your party has declared in ridings across Alberta. You can probably help me out there. But Kim wonders, are you going to run an NDP candidate in more ridings in Alberta. She says it's a bit frustrating that they're not fired up with candidates in every single riding. The Maverick Party, the People's Party of Canada, appeared to be more prepared. Well, you know what? We will have, of course, a candidate in every single riding. We're not there yet. But we've also gone through some pretty uh, rigorous processes to make sure the candidates that we do run are are amazing. Um, You know, I look at, at candidates like Sean Gray, who's running in Riverbend. I look at candidates like uh, Kathleen is running in St. Albert. Like these are incredible folks that are doing incredible work. And so I feel that the NDP has gone beyond what many, many of the other parties, I don't know what the Maverick party's, uh, policy is for for vetting candidates and getting candidates but we've gone out of our way to make sure that our candidates are amazing so i guess it takes a little bit longer to do that heather mcpherson is the ndp candidate in edmonton strathcona for the last two years she's been the only and did you get sick of hearing that by the way do you get do you just roll your eyes when people say that introduce you like that I just don't want to be the only one after September 20th. There you go. The or- <laughs> You want to grow the Orange Island. Heather McPherson, the thanks for making Dodge, yourself yeah. available. It's been good to talk to you. Nice to talk to you as well. Our election coverage, of course, will continue leading up to September 20th. If there's a candidate you'd love to hear from, let us know. Obviously, within reason, we commit to equitable coverage, which means you'll be hearing voices from different political parties. And we'll we'll, we'll lean a little heavier on the pundits. That, uh, to me, is where people find a lot of value. We try to sift through all the noise and the messaging. And, of course, a big part of that is based on the feedback that you provide to us. You can, of course, employ our hashtag anytime Real Talk RJ. That hashtag is powered by the team at Park Power. If you check out their website right now, bring your business over there, internet, electricity, or natural gas. So long as you use the promo code 2021 Real Talk, they're going to give you $70 off your first bill. I like to put it this way they're going to buy you dinner, they're going to thank you. For coming on over to Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider. Great tips as well on their social media channels. I know I talk about them all the time. It's because I find true value there. Just yesterday, just yesterday on their Instagram, they were talking about frayed wires and how dangerous frayed wires can be around the house. When's the last time your big corporate power provider warned you about frayed wires? It's what you get when you go local with Park Power at parkpower.ca. We also wanted to remind you that if you are going to be traveling, I mean, if you're thinking about getting out there, if you're thinking about making your way to a southern destination, you're ready to get some fresh air you can fly right now non-stop from edmonton to san diego as of october 31st swoop is offering that flight i want you to give you an opportunity to park your money in the bank park your car at jet set parking you can use the promo code real talk to park for get this five dollars a day for any travel by the end of 2022 five dollars a day you can book online right now at jetsetparking.com they're locally owned 
and I promise you'll love them. Well, this is a story that as Jillian's email reiterated right out of the gates on this morning's show has not gleaned, I don't think, enough public attention. It's the relationship, the correlation between pregnancies and COVID-19. We're going to find out why Alberta leads the nation in COVID cases among expectant mothers. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the program Dr. Verana Carrot, Section Head of the Maternal Fetal Medicine Program in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Alberta. She's also a clinical assistant professor at the University of Calgary Cumming School of Medicine. Dr. Eliana Castillo is a clinical associate professor at the Cumming School of Medicine at the UFC as well, a reproductive infectious diseases specialist. The two doctors are involved in that national COVID-19 pregnancy registry you may have heard of, leading up the Alberta section. And I'm very excited that Maria Castrejon has agreed to join us, a new mom. Uh, who struggled with whether or not to get the COVID-19 vaccine. She's the co-chair of the Partner Patient Research and Advisory Council. A warm welcome to the three of you, and, and thank you so much for being with us. Dr. Carrot, why don't we start with you? Why do you think people haven't been talking about this? How much of an issue is it, really, the correlation between COVID-19 and pregnancies? So we are very concerned and we have been throughout the entire pandemic about the impact of COVID on pregnant women. I think initially when we were just learning about COVID in pregnancy in the first wave, we were gathering data, trying to understand how this might impact pregnancies. And over the last year or 18 months, we have collected the data across Canada with a great uh, national team that shows us that uh, COVID infection in pregnancy is more severe um, when we compare the outcomes of pregnant women to a non-pregnant age cohort. So we're seeing increased uh, rates of severe disease that causes increased rates of hospitalization, increased admissions to the ICU, um, ventilation. And then very concerning is that we're also seeing increased rates of preterm birth in women who are infected with COVID in pregnancy. Dr. Castillo, do we understand why at this point or or are we just at uh, at the stage where we're making these observations and can't ignore them? Thank you, Ryan. Um, the why has to do with just all the adaptations that the pregnant body makes, you know, during pregnancy. Uh, it's no surprise that COVID-19 does this. Respiratory viruses and serious respiratory infections have always hit pregnant uh, women and pregnant women very hard. So influenza has been was or like pandemic influenza and endemic influenza sends women to hospitals, sends women to intensive care units and uh, and, and, and kills women. Um, we have seen it with pneumococcal pneumonia. Uh, we saw it with Ebola. So in general, um, uh, the pregnant body is working hard time, has to pump blood for two, for three sometimes, uh, has is already... Uh, using up all the oxygen supply that they that, that she needs for herself, but it's also using up to provide for the baby. So really the reserve that a pregnant body has to take on uh, an infection that will affect her capacity to breathe and to deliver oxygen and uh, will impact her ability to pump blood for you know her vital organs and the little growing one. Um, is no surprise. So, so we, what we have seen with COVID nineteen is a very similar. Um, well, is worse certainly with Delta and is worse with COVID nineteen. But it's no surprise for uh, those of us that uh, um, that see uh, pregnant people with uh, severe infections. Maria, what was what was the source originally of, of your vaccine? hesitance did it, did it have to do with with the child you were carrying or was it a bigger picture concern of, of, about the development of the vaccines what, what was going on in your mind as you were making that decision for yourself well i think that as new parents we have a lot on our plate 
is a challenge to be pregnant or breastfeeding during a pandemic. I mean, this is our first pandemic and it's our first pandemic being parent. So as every mom in the world and in the province, I just want the best for my baby and I want to protect my baby. So when I need to take my own decision, I experienced a lot of hesitancy because I had a lot of questions regarding vaccination safety and possible side effects for my baby. That sounds like a pretty normal concern. I see that both doctors are nodding. I mean, uh, <laughs> Dr. Karen, I mean, that, that, you know, people carrying, you know, children, people expecting have, have been worried about what they eat, have been worried about what they breathe, have been worried about all kinds of things, everything they ingest for years and years. No surprise this is any different. No, the, it's it's not a surprise. In general, when we look at vaccination rates in pregnancy, let's say for our yearly flu vaccine, which is recommended as a safe option in pregnancy, we do see much lower rates in pregnancy than in the general population, because it's exactly as you said, that women want to do the very best that they can. And so they're often very nervous about taking a medication and vaccination falls in that category. Uh, and that's what I've been hearing from my patients in clinic is, what do we know about this vaccine? Is it safe? Could it harm my baby? Uh, and the message that we are trying to put out there loud and clear is, this is a safe and effective vaccine. We have more and more data coming out of the US and the international community about the safety profile with registries looking specifically at pregnant women who have received the vaccine or breastfeeding women. And, and I think the big message to get out there is that if you get vaccinated, you make antibodies that can cross the placenta and provide protection for your baby. Because those newborn babies that you bring home, they can't have a vaccine in the first few months of life. And so we are protecting them by not only being vaccinated ourselves, but also giving them that passive immunity to get the best start in life. Maria, how did you ultimately make your decision? I mean, what led you to the point where you decided to get vaccinated? Well, uh, it's amazing when a professional is able to answer your questions. Unfortunately, when I went to the vaccination clinic, they asked me if I had questions. And I when I shared my concerns, they just told me that they didn't have enough time to answer my concerns. So I was really mad but I took the time to make my own research and to talk to different health professionals, different health providers, review scientific data, talk with my husband. And at the very end, I made the decision. I made an informed decision because I realized that taking the vaccine was the best way to protect myself and to protect my baby. It was a relief to know that that passive immunity is a reality and that through breast milk, I'm also protecting my baby. So that was my story, but I know that there are a lot of moms outside that are struggling with the same and they deserve to have this information that you are providing today on their hand. Well, and and can I say information that you are also helping to provide, Maria? Are you are you kind of do you kind of are you are you surprising yourself even? I mean, at, at, at one point you're an average citizen with regular types of questions about the vaccine, and and now you're the co-chair of the Partner Patient Research and Advisory Council. I mean, what prompted you to take that next step? Why are you here on the show today? Well, because I struggled it was a lot for me, so. I imagine that there are a lot of moms in the same position. There are a lot of dads in the same position of my husband. And I want to let them know that they are not alone, that we all deserve information. We all deserve to be able to make informed decisions and at the end protect our babies and do what is best for them. And of course, for us as a community. Hmm. We've got a, an audience member uh, operating under the handle still masked 
right now and, and, and still masked, says, I'm a mama who got the vaccine to protect me and my kiddo. And as soon as I could get it, my lactation doctor and my pediatrician gave me all of the information I needed. And at that point, it was a no brainer. Uh, Dr. Castillo, do we have all the information we need? I mean, like, let's let's have some real talk here. Are there still some some undetermined factors? Are there still some risks? Let's put all the cards on the table here. You know that expectant moms are going to want to have all the possible information at their disposal. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. So I have to say the data that we have now is far beyond (laughs) reassuring and that actually we had for... um, many other vaccines in the short time frame that the that the mRNA vaccines in particular, because those are the ones that we are recommending for pregnant uh, patients are. So we so we do know that those vaccines don't make it to the bloodstream. So the vaccine product itself doesn't make it to the little baby, right? right? It, it really stays in, you know, in the lymph node and making sure that the maternal body makes a protective antibodies. So we do know that. We do know that the, you know, like, like the composition of the vaccine and the things like the, the, yeah, the ingredients of the vaccine do not pose a risk for uh, pregnancies. Um, we do know that the amount of antibodies that a mom makes after the vaccine are higher uh, in quantity and in better quality are kind of more sticky antibodies than the ones that she makes if she gets COVID-19 infection. So we have data that have compared moms who got COVID-19 and have compared the, uh, the moms who actually got the vaccination. And we have me- data that has measured the antibodies and shows that actually the ones from the vaccine out of higher quantity and better quality. And um, uh, so I have to say it's very, very reassuring. One, I when, when I listen about the concerns and where moms are coming from, I can totally understand where they're coming from because just look at our language, Ryan. I mean, just go to the pharmacy and, you know, or, or anything that over the counter, are you pregnant? Talk to your doctor make this decision, be careful, because if something happens to your baby, we, all our language is so fear inducing and so fear mongering in a way um, that, and, and, and behind that language, of course, is, you know, no one wants to be liable, you know, no one wants to go back to the terrible stories of 40 years ago, uh, when, you know, thalidomide caused birth defects. So, so we, our language doesn't help the confidence um, for moms. But, but to answer specifically your question, do we have enough data to recommend this vaccine? Yes, we, we do. We do, absolutely. And um, not only for pregnancy, but also for lactation. Is more data coming? Yes, there is more data coming. So the data that we have from the US is what we call post-marketing surveillance data. So uh, what has happened after the vaccine was licensed and actually there are at least 140,000 moms who have chosen to get vaccinated for COVID. Uh, We actually uh, have data from about 17,000 moms who got the COVID-19 vaccine and then they enroll in a study to say, you know, I got a sore arm, did I get a sore throat, did I miscarry, did I have a miscarriage, and uh, that data that is actually self-reported, right, it's not, you know, scientific people looking in a database, but actually asking moms exactly what happened to them and they taking the initiative to go and, you know, log in and, you know, in a survey, what has happened to them is very reassuring. So um, I think we are in very good shape. Are you going to get any, you know, any of the regulatory bodies to say um, right off the bat, this is 100% safe in pregnancy? We were trained, Brian, to say, to never say nothing is 100% safe. This is what we were trained. We were told, just never say that. Um, And um, 
because there is, you always have to be very cautious as physicians, as scientists, we have to be cautious and always measure and always stick to the facts. And I don't think that has served us well. And more importantly, it has not served our patients well. Ah, doctor, I, first of all, love how you communicate. Um, you're, 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 you're right, though. Because and 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 who can blame? I mean, Maria, you can understand this too, right? I mean, if, if someone says it's ninety nine percent safe, you're going to go. What if I'm the one percent? Right? What if I'm the one percent? And everyone's going to hear a story about somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that was the one percent. And it's so difficult, Doctor Carrot. I see you nodding your head. I mean, let me ask you this: This was just yesterday. I'll acknowledge it's in the United States, but but the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, approving the first. COVID-19 vaccine. This is the Pfizer BioNTech one that will now be marketed as Comirnaty. How big is that with regards to confidence? You know, I, I've thought a lot about this and I've, I've had conversations with people about this. Of Will that final sort of stage of approval really make a difference? I'm not sure that the FDA approval in the U.S. will be the piece that will make the difference for pregnant women in Alberta. I think it's um, getting out there, talking to other moms, understanding why people have made the decision to get the vaccine or not get the vaccine, because I do think it's really a personal decision. It goes back to, uh, you know, your family situation, your exposure risk, and just wanting to do the best you can possibly do uh, for your newborn or unborn child. So, I see that the FDA has given it its final approval and not just emergency approval, but I'm not sure for us in in day to day walk of life that that would make a huge difference. Uh, I wish I could say otherwise. I wish there was that silver bullet that we could find that would motivate people to to go ahead. Um, you know, for me, um, very personally, seeing pregnant women ventilated in the ICU having difficult conversations with their husband to say, you know, what are we gonna do if she deteriorates? Do you want us to do an emergency C-section to try and save this fetus that's just on the brink of viability? Um, those are crushing conversations. And we have a way to prevent those and that's the vaccine. And I think when you're seeing those families go through that, uh, it motivates me to keep going and get the message out there because I don't want to have one more of those conversations at the side of someone's bed. Um, they're devastating. Yeah, doctor, to, to clarify, you're not talking about hypotheticals. These are these are conversations that you have had. Correct. Yes, we have had women in the ICU on ventilators, uh, women in the ICU having emergency C-sections prior to being intubated because their condition is deteriorating and we're trying to do everything to save a baby and save a mom's life. These are real situations that we are encountering in Alberta. And I will add that in the last few weeks with the Delta variant, the rates of admission, um, the rates of new infection, the mums are sicker. Um, you know, it's a race against time because these variants are, they're different. Um, and anecdotally, what we're seeing is, is they are hitting pregnant mums hard. Very hard. Maria, have you been, I mean, have you found yourself in, in this, this new role uh, with the Partner Patient Research and Advisory Council, have you, have you had a number of uh, of direct and frank conversations with other pregnant moms, other expectant moms? I mean, c can you characterize? I mean, I know that you can certainly empathize with them because you've been there. You've experienced that hesitancy, and, and, and then you've come out the other side and, and made a decision um, that obviously you're very confident about now to get vaccinated. How, how would you characterize the tone of, of the conversations you've had and, and what would be your message? I know that this interview will be shared many times. People are going to think of the one person in their life who's expecting, and they're going to send that person this link. And so I want to invite you to speak to those people. Now, what's your message? Yeah, um, that's true. And that's why I'm here because I want those parents to feel free to ask and resolve your concerns. I know that it's a very difficult situation and I am sure that everyone wants to do the best for their babies and to protect them and keep them alive in the middle of this pandemic. So people is really afraid out there. It's, 
in fear, but people have the right to make informed decisions. So if you are feeling hesitant, if you are experiencing that fear, that anxiety, please don't be shy. Please ask, do your own research. See what the experts uh, that we have today and too many others that are able to explain you and talk to them. Talk to them until you realize what is best for you and for your baby. Because I know that it could be challenging, but at the end we are responsible not only for ourselves, we are responsible for our babies and our kids. Doctors, I want to ask you this in closing and, and feel free to tack on anything that we may be missing here. I, I know that this is sort of a, a conversation oftentimes where details can be important. I want to show you some statistics as if these are new to you. But for our audience, when it, when it comes to the, the numbers, we know Canadian surveillance of of COVID-19 in pregnancy. There have been at least to the point where this was put together, this data compiled up until uh, a very short time ago this month, uh, just under 8000 cases of COVID-19 among expectant mothers in Canada disproportionately. Almost 30 percent of those cases have occurred in Alberta. Alberta's seen uh, way more cases than Ontario or Quebec, obviously, with larger populations. Dr. Castillo, why do you think that is? Well, Ryan, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so it's important to realize that the data, that the numbers that you see for Quebec are not finalized. Like Quebec uh, took, um, you know, they, they had to work through a very difficult uh, process to get their data up. Um, and so the final numbers actually made, like the discrepancy may not look as, as um, bad as it looks right now. Uh, on the other hand, um, what is important to understand is that in Alberta, we have had an, um, uh, an amazing collaboration with our public health officials and, uh, with, uh, and, and we have an incredible data uh, ecosystem that has allowed us to actually do a very good job at detecting infections. And, you know, I, I shouldn't be do, doing this, but probably bragging about the, the very good team that we have had to detect infection. So um, so part of the discrepancy that you see is because we have a very good system in place to detect infections. And probably it might be more robust than what other provinces have. On the other hand, um, there is no question that um, Alberta has a very young community uh, a, you know, uh, that we have. Um, uh, that we have um, uh, new Canadians, uh, that we have large community, communities with visible minorities that have been hit very hard by the pandemic, and that is represented in um, our numbers. Um, one last message that I would like to get across is that um, we we, we have to find ways and we are working on them to, to, to get moms, uh, new, new mothers, new fathers, new parents to, to shift um, our, you know, our common knowledge that sometimes protecting ourselves and protecting our babies is by actually putting something in our bodies that sometimes we have to protect Sometimes protection is by vaccinating or by putting things in our bodies rather than not. And, and I think is, is that we, we have an, this incredible fear of the unknown, of whether, vac whether an unknown vaccine or an unknown something can get into our body uh, or can do when it gets into our body. Um, and it's very hard for many people to actually see what Dr. Kurat sees or what those, you know, families of uh, at least, um, I think two or three mothers in the intensive care unit that are right now with a pregnancy are seeing. That, that, that reality may not speak to the 2,500 moms who have had COVID-19 in, in this province. 
Um, but I think it's very important that in this particular situation, mothers and parents and parents do a risk negotiation and the risks of the Delta variant are right here. And the theoretical risks of a vaccine are, as I am, as I have trained not to say, basically zero. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate you swimming upstream against some of your communications training uh, to cut to the chase. It's why we call the show Real Talk and it's what the audience expects. And so we appreciate that. I've seen that sentiment expressed in so many different ways from ep epidemiologists and virologists all the way through to to average ordinary folks like me and and people just saying, you, you know, what's more dangerous than the vaccine is COVID-19. I know a yes. lot of people have been talking about and Dr. Kurt, I want to I want to give you the last word on this and, and I'll put it in the form of a question from an audience member from Penny in just a second. But I cannot ignore that people are angry right now. People are really upset right now because of the my freedoms crew, right? Because of yeah. the fact that we're seeing a fourth wave. It is undeniable. Mask mandates in some jurisdictions are coming back. There's talk of uh, complications and consequences for members of the public that could extend into the fall and the winter that continue to drag this out. So there's the people that won't get vaccinated. And then there's the people that have been double vaxxed. They're fully vaccinated and, and they experience what, what we would call. And obviously, I'm not pretending to be a doctor, but a, but a breakthrough case where you can still contract COVID-19 even if you're vaccinated. Penny's wondering how dangerous is breakthrough COVID for an expectant mother? If she's been fully vaxxed and perhaps gets a breakthrough case, how dangerous could that be? That's a great question because uh, I've seen people ask that question, but also use it as part of their argument of saying, well, people are still getting COVID, so why should I bother getting vaccinated if it doesn't really work? And I think the, the message there is that we are seeing for those individuals who are fully vaccinated, yes, you can still get COVID, um, but it's a milder um, condition that is unlikely to have a severe disease that would land you in the hospital. So when you look at the folks that are hospitalized or are in the ICU, 90% of those people are not vaccinated. So it's only a very small proportion of people who do get really severe disease who've been vaccinated. And really, I guess my message would be, um, it's the best thing we've got to protect you and your baby and to try to get back to doing the things that we love to do. I get the anger, I get the frustration, um, the mixed messaging. I think we're all feeling that, but my number one message is to say, get out there, find out the information, um, do what's right for you. And as Dr. Castillo has said, you know, with every piece of data we have so far, I feel very comfortable saying, get out there, get the vaccine. It is safe and it um, it's the best thing that we can do. Is it perfect? No, but again, very few things are perfect, but we can get ahead of this and we know how to do that. Um, and so I invite people to consider it and just get out there, as Maria has said, get the information, make the right decision for you. Um, and our recommendation is, is that in pregnancy, um, please get the vaccine. Don't wind up in hospital, in the ICU, in the emergency department, because it is real. That's uh, Dr. Vrena Curret. Uh, Dr. Eliana Castillo has also been our guest. And Maria Castrejon. I, uh, Maria, I'm a little bit appalled that it's taken me about a half an hour to congratulate you on your beautiful bundle of joy. So <laughs> congratulations on that front as well. And thank you to the three of you. This has been nothing short of a public service today. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much, Brian. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody that has uh, corresponded with us and left your comments here. I mean, there's there's been so many good questions here. Um, I hope that I hope that real talkers, I hope that audience members, I hope their chests puff up a little bit when 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 we put one of their questions in front of an expert guest who says that's a really good question. I hope your chest puffs up a little bit. And, and can I get a little bit? Can I get a little bit in the weeds and get a little bit niche here for a second? I see that one of our regular commenters by the name of Ryan Bolin has just shared with the group, has just shared with the live chat that, that he and his wife are expecting. 
I happen to know that Ryan's wife is named Melissa, and I happen to know that for a fact because many, 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 many moons ago, Ryan secretly entered a contest while I was hosting a morning television show called Breakfast Television to win an engagement ring. And Ryan elevated himself above all the others, won the ring, asked Melissa to marry him. They went somewhere beautiful. I don't remember. They got married on a beach somewhere. And it's amazing for me to see years and years later that they're now expanding their family. So a personal congratulations to the Bolin family. Uh, and thanks for tuning in to Real Talk each and every day. We really appreciate it. You can send in your uh, correspondence. I mean, your feedback. I'm curious to know, I mean, Jillian's email. How passionate was that this morning? I mean, she just poured it out. And I know that she's been participating in our chat this morning as well. You can drive the editorial process on this show. If there's something you'd like to hear more about, if you have specific questions that Sarah Hoyt Hoyles can book expert guests on No Pressure Hoyles, and we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> She's always checking the... You should see her face right going, oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Jasper. Well, thanks very much for that. I really appreciate it. But of course, that's such an important part of what we do here is the the, the continued uh, correspondence and the back and forth between us and you. It's why we call this a community, and it's why we're thrilled to have so many people joining us on our journey. We're going to talk to author Seth Klein coming up in about 10 minutes from now about his relatively new book, A Good War. Uh, he's the team lead with the Climate Emergency Unit. Uh, a Good War is a book about mobilizing Canada for the climate emergency. He's an adjunct professor with Simon Fraser University's Urban Studies Program. I'm sure that not everybody is going to agree with Seth Klein's take on this, which is, you know, those are the interviews that, quite frankly, I look forward to the most. That's coming up in just a moment. Let me remind you how proud we are to partner with the teams at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Watching the news last night, they had they had the new commercial about the 2022 Grand Cherokee L. The Grand Cherokee L is the first Grand Cherokee with a third row of seats. This is one I know that's going to appeal to a lot of families. Hey, we didn't even plan this. Do you have a new arrival on the way? Why not trust the safety features of the new 2022 Sam Brooks just rolling his eyes right now. I can't help myself. I mean, sometimes these things just fall in our lap, Sam. You are the master of the ad segue. Well, this is you are the master. This is why Canadians have trusted the Grand Cherokee for years and years and years. But seriously, it's an unbelievable looking SUV. It's the best selling SUV in Canadian history. And you'll find the best selection of Jeep Grand Cherokees, the entire Jeep lineup. But don't forget Dodge, too, at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. We also want to remind you that Trash Talk is coming up on Thursday this week. Our team is taking Friday and the next week off and that means that trash talk your opportunity to get whatever you need off your chest goes thursday you've still got a couple of days to send us your gripes your rants i'm curious to know what you're going to come up this week come up with this week real talkers talk at ryanjesperson.com is where you can submit those it's presented by the team at local waste services they've been in business family owned and operated independently for a quarter century. You can connect with them today for a bin in Alberta, in Saskatchewan at localwaste.ca. But here's the thing. This is a company that is always expanding. If you're an entrepreneur that sees an opportunity to maybe get a foothold into a new market, Chris and Lauren and Mikkel would love to hear from you. You can find their contact information again at localwaste.ca or give them a call at 780-809-5013. We always put the call out for non-political trash talks, but now we're like leading up to a federal election. There's a lot going on with COVID-19 to get regional for a moment in Alberta right now, an undeniable fourth wave. Uh, the Delta variant, I mean, more than 2000 new cases over the weekend. That, that, that kind of sounds like a number of months ago, doesn't it? I mean, what's old is new again. And Alberta's premier, Alberta's health minister, AWOL right now. Yeah, no sign of them. No sign of them. And so I suspect that trash talk may have a, a political angle to it, to put it lightly this week. But of course, we're also looking for things that drive people crazy, like uh, folks who put empty boxes back in the cupboard or people who don't fully put the lid on things, who don't screw the lid on things when they put them back into the refrigerator. We had that very memorable email from someone a while ago about the ice tray not getting refilled. Mm -hmm. These are the trash talk submissions that fill our hearts. 
you know, we ask you to take action on this show a lot. We want to hear from you, quite frankly. It's why the show's called Real Talk. And a big part of that is our question of the week presented by our official research and strategy partners at Y Station. They do just a great job for us. Our August 9th topic was the Olympic Games and a whole bunch of you, hundreds of you chimed in, letting us know how you feel about the biannual spectacle. One of, if not the biggest sporting spectacles in the world. And here are some of the high level observations of What you told us, as we note today, the opening ceremonies of the Paralympic Games, and we'll have content on that in days to come. Here are some of the observations that the team at Y Station made after you chimed in. Almost 40% of real talkers, 39% of you, believe that the Tokyo Olympics were too risky and should not have been held. Now, Hoyles, I know you've seen that graphic before, and when we reviewed it as a team, I noticed you didn't say told you so. But I thought 40% was, to be honest with you, higher hmm. than what I was expecting. That's almost half. I mean, it's, it's technically just over a third, 39%. <laughs> but, but if I were to be dramatic, I might say it's, it's almost half. I was a little surprised at that. Hmm. I, I, thought it, I, I honestly would have forecasted 15 20% would have thought it was too risky to hold the Olympic Games. Were you surprised to see almost 40%? I find that encouraging. You told us that's how you felt. Yeah. You had your heart on your sleeve. You didn't, you didn't pull punches. You didn't mince words. Heck, that doesn't sound like me to mince words. No. Uh, no, I, I, I thought that that was foolish, foolhardy. But I also knew that when it comes right down to it, dollar, dollar, <laughs> dollar yeah. spent, they felt like they needed to just get her done. Although I'd really like to see the numbers on these games because you have to assume that they're bleeding hundreds oh, of yeah. millions of dollars. But I feel like they, they knew that they like ripped the Band-Aid off, that they needed to get it done now because it, if they waited any longer, it was just they're just going to bleed more money. Sam, were you surprised to see 39% of real talkers believe that it was too dangerous to hold the games? I, I think that was a bit of a high number. Like, I'm kind of with you. It's like there definitely was a real sentiment that the games were a little too dangerous. And I was a little bit in that camp as well. You know, I, I kind of thought that... I want the Olympics to go ahead. I want to find a safe way to do it. But, you know, Japan did not have the vaccine levels to have any sort of, you know, meaningfully safe environment for it. So I think that there was a, there was a real disconnect with, you know, what we're experiencing here in Canada. And, and then we sent our athletes over there and it's a whole new reality. Mm. And I think that, you know, part of that is a little bit reflected in the numbers is that you know, we we see things through the lens of our own reality. And, you know, the fact is that they were in single digit percentages of vaccine uh, uptake in the population in Japan that was just basically based on supply levels. Well, so Japan was basically yeah. in the midst of an outbreak when the game started. Exactly. And you remember those early stories and, and again, this is kind of cherry picking a story to acknowledge. But you remember when athletes started showing up in the village and they were like, there's a case already. Yeah. And everyone's going, oh, here we go. And ultimately, you didn't see cases run rampant through athlete populations. But at the same time, I can see where people are coming from. I Sam, just, can you? Uh, sorry. I, I just, uh, it ticks me off that we're, we're talking about the Olympics and everyone's like, yeah, we need to have the Olympics. It needs to happen. Meanwhile, over there, we've got the Taliban. Over there, we've got this new report, the IPCC report, saying that we're, you know, crisis as far as the climate. I'm just like, can we just stop? But that's kind of what sports offers people, right? Like that's that's uh, and I'm not I'm not being devil's advocate here. It's true. Sports is the escape from reality. I mean, that's kind of why I mean, for some people, sports is the reality, but that. (laughs) But that's why so many people, I think, believe that it is important. Let's get to some of the other numbers. Let's okay, see, because, okay, because we touch on this. We do touch on it in the survey. 64% of you that responded to our question of the week, and, and quite frankly, we'd like to see more of you chime in on this week's, this one about the federal election. But 64% of Real Talkers think that Canadians can be proud of our Olympic athletes while still engaging with national dialogue about the legacy of residential schools. That was an interesting angle that the team at Y Station took. Two out of three of you said we can still have those tough conversations about reconciliation, residential schools, and Canada's colonial history while still celebrating the Olympic Games. Here's another observation from the team at Y Station. When it came to the biggest moment for Canada and the biggest overall moment at the Olympics... The Canadian women's national soccer team winning gold was the top option. 
43% of you said it was the biggest moment for Canada. 32% of you said it was the biggest moment overall. And let's get to another one here. This is an interesting one. This was one that kind of jumped out at me. One out of four of you, 25% of Real Talkers said that Simone Biles, the famed American gymnast, was the most consequential athlete closely followed by Canadian gold medalist, decathlete Damian Warner, and, of course, one of all, Canada's all-time great athletes, soccer star Christine Sinclair. So one out of four of you said that Simone Biles was the most consequential athlete, not taking away from her obvious excellence when it comes to gymnastics. How much of that do you think had to do with the courage and quite frankly, the leadership that she showed on the mental health front. I think that's all of it. It's almost all of it. I mean, the fact that she is the GOAT when it comes to gymnastics, that that then she is also able to say, look, I'm, I am the best in the world, but my mental health is far superior to that. Like, I, I need to put that as the priority. I think that is incredible bravery, courage, vulnerability, mm. humility. Uh, Strength. I like that you tapped into humility mm. and humility and strength back to back, which is possible. So generally, you like the Olympics, real talkers, at least a majority of you do. 56% said, yeah, I like the Olympics. But when we asked about whether or not you're maybe done with the whole spectacle and think it's obsolete, 31% said yes. One in three said the Olympic Games are obsolete. Hoyles is looking at this like a victory. What are you trying to cancel the Olympic Games? Yes. The conversation about transgender athletes is very interesting and we want to remind you by the way that if you support us on patreon and we're so grateful to those of you that do you can learn more about that at the top of the page at ryanjesperson.com every sunday or at least when we have a top line report to release typically they're 15 to 20 pages they're fascinating reads there's so much work that goes into them our Patreon supporters receive those as a token of our thanks. And so many of you have already read this entire report. and You've been able to read all the comments and see all the data. We can only share a certain amount here on the show for obvious reasons. But while things on the transgender athlete front seem to be heading in the direction of inclusion, trend-wise, statistically, there are some very divided thoughts on the issue and a surprising amount of uptake on the more traditional positions. So you can check out uh, some of the mentions on that are Patreon supporters. And, and, and that's a conversation that we're going to have on this show uh, in weeks and months to come. We wanted to get data on that first. And so we can reference the data in the interview. You know how I know it's an important conversation to have? Because I am terrified to have it. I am absolutely terrified to have that conversation. I don't know what real talkers have against surfing. 30% of you, one in three almost, want surfing gone from the Olympic Games, which I thought was a really interesting statistic. I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, of all the sports to get rid of, skateboarders are probably thrilled about it, right? Let those water athletes get there. Let, let's keep the wheeled athletes in the games, right? I want to do some justice to the numbers on that story of the, the emergence of transgender and non-binary athletes, including an athlete that won a gold medal for Canada in soccer. 48% of you said that transgender and non-binary athletes are a reality in the future of sports, and it'll change how we categorize athletes and organize competition. It's almost half. 41% of you said that the debate is over, and the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and regulatory bodies for sports need to develop aligned policies to accommodate athletes before qualifying. 41% of you also said you think it's, quote, ridiculous to think an athlete would go through everything a transgender person is subjected to in order to win a medal. But that's less than half, Oils. Only 41%. 15% of you said it's simple. You should be required to compete as the gender you identified as during Olympic qualifying competition. 11% of you, 1 in 10, said, nah, it's simple. You should be required to compete as the gender you were assigned at birth. And 8% of you said, I think it's, it's a reality that an athlete would claim a false gender identity to get an edge in competition. You know why I'm so scared to have this conversation? 
Because I think of all the conversations that we have, I mean, we're about to talk to Seth Klein, the author, about the environment and about climate leadership and what a good war against climate change looks like. And for the most part, while people might disagree on strategy, approach, political policy, people will agree, I think, that it makes sense to save the planet. We can find common themes or threads in other potentially divisive conversations. I suspect... And I hope maybe that the audience proves me wrong, but I don't know. I suspect that a conversation, and I'm speaking real here, on transgender or non-binary athletes might be the most divisive conversation we've had yet on the show. Hmm. Do you feel the same way? Uh, I'm, I'm right there with you with I'm scared to have it because I think that there will be some insensitivity and there, you know, or claims of insensitivity I, like but even it, then but even then right uh, even when you say insensitivity people will say well to who and then you'll say well i'm obviously implying insensitivity toward or discrimination yeah. toward transgender and non-binary athletes and then people will say but what about insensitivity to athletes that have trained their whole lives only to see the dynamic of the field of competition change and then we'll talk about who's being more insensitive to whom and whose rights matter more and do you get what I'm saying? And really, who are we most concerned about? We're not concerned about if someone has transitioned to be uh, to, to to be a transgender man, uh, someone who is a transgender man. Um, that's not a concern. They're like, ah, no, no big deal. It's the other way. That's I feel like that's when people get their, you know. It's why the conversation was so different about the gold medal, the first non-binary Olympic athlete in human history to win a gold medal for Canada in soccer was so different than the conversation about the field of competition in women's powerlifting. Mm -hmm. They were completely different conversations. It was a celebration on one front and it was a debacle on the other. Yeah. The celebration or like, just kind of like the hashtag. No, thank you. You remember that? Yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google the hashtag. No, thank you. You'll see what I'm talking about. We asked about your feelings on the emergence of transgender and non-binary athletes competing in the Olympic Games. One of you said it seems like a complicated thing that I'm glad I don't have to write policy for. Another says if transgender individuals would like to compete in the Olympics, they should have their own category. Watching the Olympics and having been involved in sports for many years, it's unfair to born. These are reading comments. I'm reading comments as they were written, as they were submitted on our question of the week. Some of you may take issue with some of the phrasing or some of the wording. This is what audience members wrote to us. Says this audience member, it's unfair to born female genders to complete to compete with transgender athletes. The games must be fair and equal. There is already disparity between wealthy countries and developing countries. Don't ruin the modern day Olympics. Another says this is a tough question because it, it partially seems unfair on many fronts. Definitely, transgender or non-binary athletes should be able to compete in the Olympics, but it could give a person an edge over competition, considering realities around anatomy. Honestly, I think that it's great that there are athletes representing the LGBTQ2S plus community, but I honestly think it's really forcing us all to think about how we categorize the Olympics by male and female. It's obviously not so black and white. And it never has been. Like... The fact that Caitlyn Jenner uh, w- w- competed in the Olympics just goes to show you that this is they've always they've always existed. It's just how we've categorized folks, which kind of brings me, Sam, can we pull up that fifth and final graphic here? This was an interesting one. Now, this is not necessarily the same thing. Maybe don't read too much into this. But there was that that new event, that mixed relay, Right. Where, where two men and two women competed, 37%, this was interesting, of real talkers did not elect to take a position on the new mixed 400-meter relay. No opinion, said 37% of you. We'll continue to review this, and as we said, a lot of times the data that you provide to us, the feedback that you provide to us fuels some of the interviews that we'll book down the line. And so you will hear more about this Olympic Games themed question of the week in shows to come. I want to remind you again, we're polling you. We're asking your questions. We're gauging where you're at. We're putting our finger on the pulse. How many more euphemisms can I use? 
where you're at with this federal election. That's the theme of this week's question of the week, and you can answer it at ryanjesperson.com. Author Seth Klein in one minute. Let me remind you right now that our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park are putting their money where their mouth is through the month of August. You've got one more week to support the Wakutuin Society. That's because every child matters and every cone counts. One dollar from every cone sold at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. A dollar from every cone will go to the Wakutuin Society that provides retreats for Indigenous women who have shown great courage surviving both residential schools and cancer. These are women that will have an opportunity at these culturally appropriate retreats to better strengthen their mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical health. The goal, to return community leaders across the country, of course, and make an impact in so many important ways. You can visit the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park before the end of August to contribute to that worthy cause. Sam, can you call up that tweet that we saw yesterday? Check this out. We always love hearing from real talkers that are experiencing freezing brothers. I love this from S Cargo on Twitter, who said this is our go to stop in Hinton when we're traveling to Jasper. That's it. That's the freezing brothers. I've walked through those doors so many times. You walk through the doors of the Hinton Friesen Brothers, the first thing you're going to do is hang a hard right and walk to the end of the wall. That's where you'll find the beef short ribs. You think I'm lying? It's worth the drive out to Hinton just to have the beef short rib. They've got tables there you can join in house or take it with you. Friesen Brothers has what? What? Really? What? You can enjoy it in house? Have you been? Sarah Hoyles? That's the whole thing. They've got these hot kitchens. The Friesen Brothers in South Edmonton. I'm like, you're like, where do I look? Do where? I look at you to tell you, Sarah Hoyles, that this is mind blowing? Or the Friesen I- Brothers, they've got fireplaces in the grocery stores. They've got fireplaces. Like my parents live in South Edmonton, and they're a little bit obsessed with the new Friesen Brothers. I couldn't like, be I happier kid to you hear not. it. Oh yeah. Have they has, has have they shared with you? Like, do they have like a go to? No, they're like they're trying to try everything. That's just it. Like, they're, it's it's, a, it's still new to them. It's still the first few months. They're uh, still getting their feet wet. Yeah, Friesen Brothers. I know Friesen Brothers doesn't want me referring to them as a cult, but I'm just a willing member. I'm just here. I'm just, I mean, I might talk about it for free. I mean, I'm serious, but those beef shorts. So yeah, you can literally, I mean, the one in South Edmonton, I know I wanted to talk about Hinton, but let me just wax about Edmonton. Seth Klein is like, is this a fucking joke? Like, is this guy going to talk to me at any point this morning? Yes, Seth, right there. They've got craft beer on tap. They can fire pizzas in a forno oven. You can get a free, like we can even get new music bed. This thing's going on so long. A fresh sourdough sandwich, smash burgers, beef braised short ribs, whatever you want. Eat by the fireplace. Enjoy the couch. Take the family time. At Friesen Brothers, Alberta grown, Alberta owned. All right, but seriously, the planet's going to hell in a handbasket. We're killing ourselves. A year at a time. That's what the IPCC report says. Seth Klein is the author of A Good War, a book released just a short time ago, the fall of uh, 2020, mobilizing Canada for the climate emergency. He's a columnist with Canada's National Observer. He's an adjunct professor with Simon Fraser University's Urban Studies Program, and, and, and he spent more than 20 years as the founding director of the BC office of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternative. Seth Sometimes I got to keep people waiting when I'm going on about beef short ribs. I apologize, but it's really nice to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks. That lead, that lead in was, uh, I've done a lot of interviews, Brian, but that was the first lead in just like that. Yeah. Well, thanks for making time for us. So, so you say that we've got to approach climate change. We've got to fight climate change. Like we fought in world war two. When, when did this first occur to you? How, how did you start developing this, let alone turn it into a book? Yeah. Well, um, it's interesting because the, the, as you're getting at the, The original twist of my book is that uh, it's an outline for how to mobilize Canada for the climate emergency, all structured around lessons from the Second World War. But to answer your question, it didn't start out that way. Um, I originally set out to write a book that would tackle this harrowing gap that we all wrestle with between what the science, like the IPCC, says we have to do urgently on climate change and what our politics seems prepared to entertain. Um, and and how do we how do we bridge that gap? 
originally when I set out to write the book, I was only going to have a single chapter on this on lessons from the Second World War because I, I'd long been intrigued by the Second World War as as this example of rapid economic transformation. Right, we did this incredible thing in six years, uh, ramping up military production, and then and then a second time having to transition back to peacetime. But as I delved into that research, I started to see more and more parallels, um, and not just on the economic transformation. Uh, front, and also finding hopeful parallels. Like, you know, I, I think when Canadians think about what we've seen so far on climate action, nothing about it looks and sounds and feels like a grand societal undertaking. But that's that was the mobilization in the Second World War, not just on the battlefront, particularly the book deals mostly with the home front, you know, out of a population of, of 11 million Canadians, over a million of them enlisted, and over a million of them were directly employed in military production. I mean, that's mind boggling in terms of the scale of mobilization involved. And so the book is, is pulling lessons from that to say, look, this is what we did the last time we faced an existential threat and how we tackled it you know, with all we had. Um, and what would that look like today? Are you... Uh... I don't know if concerned is the right word, but would you agree that when you start talking about a dramatic societal reinvention that, that essentially talks about reinventing the economy, that talks about big, major foundational change, that you might lose the room? I mean, is that where you think you see people sort of drop off when there aren't? I mean, it sounds strange for me to put it this way, but in World War II, you know, there's concentration camps and cities are being bombed and it's staring people in the face. I, I don't know. People right now hear that over the next 10 years, there might be a degrees change in the climate. You, you know what I'm saying? It's it's not quite the same thing. Are you worried about mm -hmm. losing the room? Yes and no. Um, there's a lot in your question, Ryan. Yeah. Um, th but the first thing I, I would press back on, you know, when I first started to tell people that I was using this framework, a lot of people responded to it in a similar way as you, which is to say, yeah, but it was different back then. Everybody understood the emergency. Everyone got the threat as clear and present. They were ready to do what was required. And it isn't the same today. In fact, that's not true. Um, you know, one of the striking things, whether you think about the war or the pandemic or climate, all emergencies begin with a period of denial, right? If up until the 11th hour, before the Second World War, neither the public nor our political leaders wanted to do with it, do this. They were all in denial about what would uh, be required of us. Um, even once war was declared, historians refer to the, six, the first nine months of the war as the phony war, right? Because we declared war, but not a lot happened originally. We were all still in a state of denial. And what, what intrigues me about all of these examples, Ryan, is what's that alchemy? What's that combination of events and leadership that shifts the popular zeitgeist and moves us into emergency mode? In the war, it was probably the fall of France. That was a key event, right? Then things, things got real for people, right? But it was also leadership that had to step in and bring a public that didn't want to do this, in fact, uh, into what would be required. And it's not like I relish this. People didn't relish it in the war. They don't relish it with climate and what's going to be required. The science is the science. It's what we have to do. So, you know, do I worry about losing the room? I don't know. My point is you got to tell the truth. Um, and this is the thing about World War II leaders, right, is the ones we most remember, they weren't Pollyanna about what we had to do. They were forthright about the crisis, yet still managed to impart hope about what we were capable of. Um, and I think I think that's what we need today. It's the same with the pandemic, right? 10, 20 months ago, we can all remember, we were all in denial about how this thing was going to upend our lives. We started to hear about this virus overseas and we were all in denial. And then a combination of events and leadership, right? So the events, I don't know, Ryan, I remember when they canceled the NBA season. I, I don't even watch basketball, but I remember thinking, okay, this is different. Mm -hmm. um, but I also know that it took seeing our prime minister in front of his house every morning. That communicated that something different was about to happen. The, in, when it comes to climate, the events are happening. Now, they don't happen everywhere at the same time, which, which, which complicates matters. But in many respects, as Canadians, we are all having our summer of reckoning with the climate emergency. 
you know, in my province, we had this heat dome event in June. We lost almost 600 people in a week, which is a third as many as died the entire pandemic from COVID. Um, and then the fires. Now, you know, the prairies are in Ontario are looking at an historic drought. Um, so uh, I think the, 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 the events of which I speak that are necessary to that alchemy are in fact already happening. And what the polling tells us is that the public now gets the emergency um, and they're ready for bolder action. But the leadership, the leadership ain't there yet. I'm glad you brought up leadership. I want to ask you, and, and, and I'll lay out all four here, uh, and then I'll get you to take each one on if, if you would. In the, in the comparison here, in the metaphor, who's the Hitler? Who's the Neville Chamberlain? Who's the Winston Churchill? And what is the Pearl Harbor? Why don't we start with the Hitler? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, let me t- actually take them backwards. So the As Pearl you wish. Harbor, the, the Pearl Harbor piece is are the events, right? Um, so, in the case of the United States, it was the the final event that led to a public ready to do what was required. Although, interestingly, um, and this speaks to your job, Brian, uh, what what historians note is that. You know, the U.S. entered World War II two years after we did. We didn't wait on the Americans. Little old Canada, we, we, we spent two years, the only country in the Western Hemisphere prepared to do what was necessary. Um, but over the two years before the U.S. entered, we saw a 20 percentage point shift in U.S. public opinion about the fact that the U.S. needed to join. And that was led by people in your industry, Ryan, in particular, telling the truth and bringing the public along. Um, is there a Hitler? I don't think there's a Hitler in this scenario. Mm. I mean, some, some, some emergencies have that kind of boogeyman and others don't. Look at COVID. We, sh- we have treated COVID like the, the emergency that it is. It doesn't have a Hitler. I mean, it has this invisible virus, which is similar to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the Chamberlain and, and Churchill example is an interesting one to me, though. Um, uh, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, I just lost your screen for a moment. Um, You know what? I think the interesting moment we're in is that when an emergency becomes clear to us, sometimes the leaders we have become the people we need them to be, and sometimes they have to be replaced. Now, in the British Conservative Party, they found the latter, right? They had to switch leaders within their party from Chamberlain to Churchill. In Canada, it was the opposite. You know, we had this stodgy prime minister, Mackenzie King. If you had asked Canadians in 1938, this gang of Mackenzie King's cabinet, do they have what it takes to to lead us through a complete transformation of society and the economy? I'm certain most Canadians would have said, no, not this gang. They don't have it in them. And they had no reason to believe otherwise, because the same gang had done pretty much not, you know, virtually nothing through the through the depression. And yet when they finally came to terms the, with the emergency, that gang did precisely that. Um, but I, I would say one last thing on your question about Chamberlain. Um, there is a lot of appeasement going on. And in particular, part of what I think is holding us back is we have governments, including purportedly progressive governments, who spend a great deal of time trying to appease the fossil fuel industry. Even when so-called progressive governments bring forward their grand climate plans. They want to have representatives from the fossil fuel industry on the stage with them, telling them that this is a good plan and they can live with it. And what I'm saying in the book is at this late hour, any convincing fossil fuel, any fossil fuel plan that with which the fossil fuel industry can find comfort and say, I'm on board is probably not a fossil uh, climate plan worth having. Hmm. And I want to dig into this. Because we've got we've got a, a, a two beaver is watching right now on the live chat says it says capitalism is the Hitler here, um, which sort of strikes me as a bumper sticker in a way. But I was in, in preparing to talk to you. Um, I was doing some reading, in, in, including some some reviews on your book. And I know that you've tangled a little bit with the former editor of Alberta Oil Magazine, Max Fawcett, who has a sub stack. And I want to read this uh, to you and have you respond. 
He says, while Mr. Klein is, is happy to cast corporations and big business as the enemies, they've been doing a lot of the heavy lifting as of late on climate change. Car companies from General Motors to Volkswagen, Volvo have all announced ambitious timelines for the phase out of gas powered vehicles. Tech companies like Google and Amazon have committed to procuring 100 percent clean energy, even FedEx whose business relies on transportation more than any other, has pledged to reach net zero by 2040. They may not be the kind of allies that people like Seth Klein want in the climate fight, but they're the allies we have right now. We should think of them the way allied commanders thought about the Red Army. Not a friend and someone to monitor carefully, but a powerful source of material and strategic support. Oh, that's a really good question. So first of all, let me acknowledge there's a lot of great stuff happening in the private sector, just like the private sector had an important role to play in the Second World War. So there are companies starting to do some innovative things, starting to make some changes. But if there's one key message in my book, it's that if we are hoping to achieve what we now urgently need to achieve, voluntarily, we're fried. Let me stick with your car example for a moment and come back to your World War II question. Uh, Pearl Harbor happened in December of 1941. In February of 1942, two months later, Ryan, the last civilian automobile rolled off the assembly line in Detroit, and for the next four years, their production and sale was basically illegal. Now, that didn't happen out of the goodwill of the big three automakers. It happened because they were ordered to change what they were producing. So I, I employ... These, what I say are these four markers of emergency mode. How do you know when a government is actually in emergency mode? First of all, it spends what it takes to win. And in Canada, we're doing nothing. We're nowhere close to that. We're spending, we're off by about a tenfold order of magnitude. Two, you create new economic institutions to get the job done. C.D. Howe in the war, um, uh, no lefty, by the way. This guy's on the right wing of the of the Liberal Party. He'd made a you know, you know he'd become a millionaire in the private sector before going into office, but he's seized with the task. He's happy to give contracts to the private sector, but he's in a hurry. And any time they couldn't quickly do what needs doing to win the fight, he creates a new crown corporation to get the job done. In the course of the war, he creates twenty eight crown corporations. Okay, because that's. The contrast with our current approach is that we incentivize change, we encourage change, we send price signals, we offer rebates, we give tax cuts. We're trying to incentivize our way to victory, Ryan, and it's not gonna work. The third marker of emergency is you shift from voluntary and incentive-based policies to mandatory measures as needed. And the fourth is you tell the truth. You tell the truth about the severity of the crisis and what's required. Now, we did all of those things in the war. I would say the federal government did all of these things with COVID. And we, we do none of those things yet when it comes to the climate emergency. But I want to come back to your comment, though, uh, from the, the viewer, you know, is it capitalism and so on? I think that there's the main thing holding us back now, two related factors. The first is what I call the new climate denialism. And what I mean by the new climate denialism isn't like, you know, the Trump Bernier denying climate change. What I mean by the new climate denialism is political leaders and industry leaders who say they get the, the climate, who, who accept the reality of human-induced climate change, and yet continue to practice a, a set of policies that don't align with what the science says we have to do. But the other thing that I think holds us back, and this speaks slightly to the point your caller makes, um, is, is the legacy of neoliberalism. I won't say capitalism, but I say neoliberalism. Like, why aren't our governments spending what they need to? Why aren't they creating new crown corporations to just, just mass produce and deploy the things that we need to decarbonize our society? Why aren't they moving to mandatory measures? Because in many ways, across the political spectrum, by the way, this is true of NDP governments as well as conservative ones, they are in a straitjacket, a neoliberal straitjacket about what is and isn't allowed. Mm -hmm. And that's what we got to bust out of. or what's or what's doable or what's politically feasible. Right. Like, yes, you know, yes. res, and, and I know you'll take this comment respectfully, but but it's easier to write a book about it than to do it. Of course, of course. Um, well, but here's where I think it gets interesting. I interviewed a lot of politicians for the book. 
And I only, you know, I wasn't interested in interviewing climate deniers. I wanted to interview politicians who I genuine, genuinely believe get it, and yet whose governments aren't doing what's necessary to press them on why. Why, why do we have this gap? And, you know, they almost all fell back to a number on some variant of the line. Well, you got to meet the public where they're at and the public ain't there yet. Now, I found this a very frustrating answer because, first of all, the, the leaders we had in World War II didn't, in fact, meet the public where they were at. They took the public where they needed to go. And people in your line of work did that, too. People like Edward R. Murrow in the States and, and, uh, and the, the newly founded CBC, they all did that. Um, uh, but I also uh, wanted to test the presumption that I was hearing from these political leaders about the public. And so I commissioned my own poll from Abacus Data to see, like, is that true? And what I found in those results was a public where the, the, the politicians weren't giving them the credit. They were all saying they couldn't be bolder because the public wasn't ready. But in fact, the polling says the public gets the emergency and wants to see considerably bolder action than we have had offered thus far. And I would say, I mean, I want to come back to this incentivizing change. And I've talked about this with political leaders federally and provincially since the book came out, right? They're still approaching it through incentivization and encouragement and cajoling and price signals. But let me ask you, Ryan, when you listen to Jonathan Wilkinson or Pierre Trudeau or, or provincial leaders, do they sound to you like they are inviting their fellow Canadians to join them in a grand societal undertaking the way we did but in the I, war. And they're not. But but here, uh, by the way, I've, I had an opportunity to to speak with your sister, uh, Naomi, when when this changes everything came out. She she uh, joined me on my radio show and it was right around the time that that leap manifesto had been released and and it landed uh do I say with a thud in Alberta? You may remember right around that <laughs> I time. I remember well. You remember, remember because well. the, the NDP National Convention was in Edmonton. And yep. it was a it was a fascinating time. It was fascinating timing. Yep. To it was be a able, real gong show. To be able, <laughs> it was a bit of a gong show. And uh and that's that's why I mean I because when you start talking about things like or what was the uh I'm drawing a blank right now, but the 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 the, the IMF guy who was talking about the the big um, the the big reinvention or the dramatic what was the thing? What else do you remember? I'm putting everybody on a spot right, but it was but it was like the it was the thing through COVID that this was the opportunity for the the big mm. re the grand reset or the big reset. Right, right, right. You know, people say the leap manifesto, the grand reset. And there and, well, and let me let me let me come back to the leap manifesto. Because what's striking to me, you're right. I mean, it it caused a lot of controversy. The a lot of people in the mainstream media basically set their hair on fire. Um, that was uh, six years ago. Look at how the terrain has shifted. If you go back and read it today, to most of us, it's now pretty tame and, and widely accepted. Um, and the thing that caused the grand controversy at the NDP convention in Edmonton was the piece of the Leap Manifesto that said, we can no longer build new fossil fuel infrastructure. Not that we have to turn off the taps over, you know, tomorrow, but that we can't keep expanding with new infrastructure. This May, the International Energy Association, no left-wing think tank, Ryan, the International Energy Association is the, the global think tank created by the oil industry and the richest countries in the 1970s to, to be the think tank for the oil industry. Uh, the IEA reports are the ones that the, the Jason Kenney government and the Mo government and the Trudeau government all point to in, to justify fossil fuel projects, in May they said, we have run out the clock. There can be no new fossil fuel infrastructure as of now. That's them saying it. I mean, I've looked at their report and, 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 and was like, they just said what the Leap Manifesto said in 2015. Um, and now it's, it's the new norm. So the ter this is why I say, as I said earlier, the, the terrain is shifting. You know, if I had asked Canadians five years ago, is climate an emergency, most Canadians would have said no. And today they say yes. Um, that is people understanding these extreme weather events. And we've also now been changed by our COVID experience, right? Um, which has shown us how quickly we can move, which has shown us how you can spend what it takes to win and, 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 uh, and do what needs to be done. 
yeah, I mean, people are people are, I think, gravely concerned about and and I'm a reasonable person. OK, so I'm not going to look at a three hundred million dollar. Uh, pardon me, $300 billion, <laughs> slight difference there, $300 billion deficit, uh, you know, and I'm not going to look at a trillion dollars of federal debt right now and pretend like the federal government didn't have to do something quick and dramatic mm. to keep people from foreclosing on their houses and lose. I mean, I'm not I'm not that kind of a guy. But at mm-hmm. the same time, uh, I wouldn't say that that's a sus- and I don't think you would either, that that's a sustainable model for addressing things that are challenging us as a human population, would you? Uh, well, I don't think we, uh, as you say, in the, in that year of COVID, the federal government uh, basically spent $350 uh, billion. I don't actually think we need to spend that much um, when it comes to climate. But I do think what we've had liberated through that experience is all of these years until COVID, you know, in the face of poverty and homelessness and climate, where we were constantly told, you know, we, you know, we agree it's a big problem, but the money's not there and we can't afford it. All that's blown out the window, right? What did the government do during COVID? And in particular, the role of the Bank of Canada. Um, from the March of the first lockdown a year and a half ago, for that whole first year of COVID, the Bank of Canada was buying up federal government securities in order to finance that emergency response that we are agreed had to happen to the tune of five billion dollars a week you know what the trudeau government is spending on climate they're spending five billion dollars a year okay now i'm not saying we need to spend five billion dollars a week on climate (laughs) i'm saying we should probably be spending somewhere around 80 billion dollars a year for a good number of years to get the job done can we do that economically Absolutely, we can do that. And just like in the war, we can do it through a combination of of the Bank of Canada and selling uh, victory bonds and raising taxes. And I want to say something about the taxes front, because we need to raise certain taxes, not just to, to raise the money to spend what we have to spend. There's another important lesson out of the war that really came clear to me in my book research. In order to undertake a society-wide mobilization, you need social solidarity. You need people to feel like we're all in this together. In the first world war, we didn't have that, right? There was rampant profiteering. And so you had some people sacrificing their lives while other people were making a killing. It undermined social solidarity. It undermined recruitment. It's frankly why we had the conscription crisis. At the beginning of the second world war, the King government understood that they had to do this differently. So they raised certain taxes on wealthy individuals, on corporations. They brought in an excess profits tax. So the kind of profiteering we've seen in this pandemic was illegal in the Second World War. That's how you maintain social solidarity. And so we also need to do that in the present. And that incidentally is why I think there's a historic echo there in the appeal you see today uh, for something like the Green New Deal. When, When you present it to people and this idea of tackling the twin crises of inequality and climate together. The appeal is tremendous. It registered levels of support higher than any political party. Even 50% of Albertans, where you are, I think it sounds like a great idea. Um, So, uh, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. We had an interesting opportunity just earlier this morning as part of our ongoing election coverage to talk to Heather McPherson, who you probably know is the only new Democrat member of parliament on the prairies. I mean, literally, uh, especially in Alberta, she's on this, what she call herself in the orange dot of Edmonton Strathcona. And we got a little bit into, into the platform as much as we could given the time, you know, obviously a big part of the NDP platform, which our audience members can Google on their own is to retrofit a whole bunch of buildings and take bold climate steps. Um, and along with that, you know, the, the question I know that people roll their eyes at, but how are you going to pay for it is an important question. And there will be tax increases. They call them on the super rich. In other words, families, mm-hmm. a one percent mm-hmm. wealth tax on families with more than 10 million dollars in assets and raise taxes for any household earning two hundred ten thousand dollars annually or more. When you talk about a tax increase, what's the structure? I, I you're agree ta- with those. OK, uh, um, who are we talking about here? Well, I think I think you uh, uh, the the sorts of things that are in the NDP platform there are, are exactly what I'm getting at, um, and they're hugely popular. Incidentally, I mean the wealth tax is is incredibly popular across party lines. Interestingly, even even among conservatives, 
Um, and that's because I think people understand that we have, when, when you're facing great societal challenges like COVID, like climate, and people understand that we have to pay for it one way or another, that that makes sense as a way of doing it uh, uh, in a fair way. Um, you know, so in the book, I have a list of, of, of different options for, for how to raise the money on the tax front. Uh, but broadly speaking, they're, they're, they're along the lines of what you're suggesting. Um, but to my earlier point, I also think uh, we can sell victory bonds the way we did during the war and that what we've seen in COVID, that there is a clear role for the Bank of Canada itself, which is our crown corporation federally, right? Any earnings it gets returned to the Treasury, um, uh, that we can do it. And, and, uh, and a lot of it as well, when you think about borrowing for a lot of the climate stuff, it just makes sense, right? Interest rates are so low right now. Um, and most of the things we need to invest in as a society for climate, you know, high-speed rail, increased public transit, uh, new renewable energy utilities, uh, they all have income streams. They have monthly and daily uh, fees. Um, uh, so to not be borrowing money at less than 1% as we can now, to mass produce these things uh, that themselves have returns. It's just bad economics not to be going gangbusters doing this stuff. It's it's I mean, it's such interesting timing to state the obvious to be able to talk to you about this right now. while Federal election campaigns are underway. Right. Yeah. Because we're, yeah. I mean, we're taking a look at platforms and, and Aaron O'Toole's got the challenge of of rolling out a, a climate plan that's palatable to, to longtime grassroots conservatives that will also recruit undecided voters. Justin Trudeau's got a run on his record and the commitment that his government has made by, you know, one hundred and seventy dollars a ton in twenty forty and twenty fifty. Of course, Jagmeet Singh has his own plan, and, and who knows what the Greens are doing right now. But mm -hmm. it's interesting timing because it gives us some insight, number one, into what political parties think is sellable, and number two, into what Canadians think is palatable. Yes. Um, the challenge, of course, and I'm someone who's long hated our, our electoral system, uh, the first-past-the-post system. I'm, I've, I've long supported some form of proportional representation, because one of the dynamics that, and this is really the curse of our system, is that you have a public that a, a strong majority of which actually wants to take stronger climate action. Um, but that vote is split three and sometimes four ways, depending on where you are in the country. Um, uh, so I would love to have some form of proportional representation. But, you know, here we are in an election and, and we've got to live with the system that we have. You know, what I dearly, look, I'm going to be honest, the path to victory in the, in the face of the climate emergency is narrow. Every country has its role to play. Um, we have an important role to play because, uh, you know, our per capita emissions are very high and we are among the world's largest producers of oil and gas. Um, and um, when I think about that narrow path to victory, two things are important at this point in this election. One is I, I, I desperately hope that the Liberals are not rewarded by this cynical election call with a majority. We need a minority. Minorities are good. Uh, minorities are more accountable. Minorities have to work with others. Minority governments mean we as a public continue to get openings to press for stronger policies instead of having a government elected that can basically do it at once for four years. But the second outcome we need is to elect true climate champions across the country and in a number of political parties to bolster the, the ranks of the squad of, of brave people who get the emergency, who are ready to rally us. Um, there are such people running. And I think the challenge, uh, in fact, there's a lot of them running. And I think the challenge for all of us in our messed up system, in our individual writings, is to do the best we can to find those people, to support them. If, if you don't have such a person in your own riding that, that, that seems to have any chance of winning, find one in a neighboring riding and, uh, and do everything you can. Um, these, in the face of a climate emergency, these people are our firefighters and uh, our political firefighters, and we desperately need more of them. It's interesting. To meet this moment with us. You're you're not you're certainly not wrong. Uh, it's undeniable that that Canada's emissions are disproportionate on a per capita basis. On the flip side, you've heard this a thousand times. Don't get a migraine rolling your eyes 
But people will say that, you know, Canada's emissions in total cumulatively account for less than 2% of annual global emissions. This is more of a comment than a question to you. But to bring this back to your World War II comparison, I I guess you ask people in Holland whether or not they think that Canada made a significant contribution. You could have an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for saying that, Ryan. You're right. So I, this line is one I hear almost every time, right? We're just little old Canada and we only have less than 2% of emissions. So first of all, that's true. Bigger countries with bigger populations have higher, more overall emissions. Our per, per capita emissions are among the highest in the world. Uh, and that doesn't count our role as exporters of fossil fuels, um, where our role is much greater. But to your point, um, You know, by that logic, we would have sat out the Second World War because Canada was an even smaller country then, only 11 million people. And we didn't wait on the Americans. And as I said earlier in the interview, we were the only country in the Western Hemisphere engaged in that fight for two years. Mm. And at the end of it, nobody questioned the value of Canada's contributions at home or abroad. Seth, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I appreciate your availability. I have to, I have to ask. I mean, you and you and your sister recognized as uh, I've seen you described as Canada's most famous sibling duo activists. What, what were conversations like around the Klein dinner table? I mean, <laughs> did you guys joke around at all, or was it just serious all the time? Oh no, it, it gets, gets jokey. I'm sure it gets obnoxious too. <laughs> um, but uh, I would, you know, it's it's great to have a sister like I do. Uh, who can be a partner in this stuff. Uh, and the truth is she's my younger sister, but she, uh, she is both much smarter and a better writer than I am. Um, and, uh, and I learned a lot from her, like a lot of people around the world. I, I you know, uh, there are, there are thousands and thousands of people around the world who look to my sister to make sense of the world for them. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I get to do it over dinner uh, from time to time, make, I feel very lucky about Seth's book, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency, uh, was shortlisted for the 2021 BC and Yukon Hubert Evans Nonfiction Book Prize. It spent more than three months on the CBC Books Nonfiction Bestseller list. You can check it out anywhere you buy good books. Seth is a team lead with the Climate Emergency Unit and a columnist with Canada's National Observer. Thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. I like conversations like that. I know not everybody's going to agree. I, I know that some people think that it's a, it's a book of fallacy, and I know that a lot of people think that it's pure brilliance. I mean, this was uh, an example of a booking that we had a, a good number of real talkers saying, you know who we'd love to hear on the show is Seth Klein. Um, I got emails. Yeah. I got tweets. I got yeah. Everyone be like, get this guy. I like the dance. I like that he d- doesn't mind the criticism. I mean, I, I referenced Max Fawcett's Substack, and and people can can read that and 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 take another angle on the book where he thinks it's a it's a flawed argument. The World War II comparison. What I think we can all agree on, or at least most of us, uh, anybody that I'm interested in having conversations with, we can all agree that we've got to do something. That this is real, and uh, the timing of this is very interesting, as mentioned with that federal election i'm kind of in the mood i mean i just want to kind of carry this show on for another hour because as i've been talking to seth you know what i'm realizing it's sam i know you're laughing too i can see you over there engaged but i'm like you know i didn't plan on talking to him about the leap manifesto and the great reset thank you by the way to the real talkers that chimed in the live chat to remind me what it was that i was trying to there's so much going on but i'm trying to he's he's going you know if you take a look at the leap manifesto it's actually not as sort of out there as it was characterized as about six years ago. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, we could probably just start digging into this and take a look at this. First of all, though, it feels like a pretty good time to remind you that one of our priority partners at Kubi Energy, a private business, by the way, capitalists are helping people reach their sustainable energy goals. Uh, Jake's going to be like, would you mind just keeping that part out of the ad read? I know Jake's not going to shy away from that. They're doing good business, and it's because more and more people are realizing that integrating solar into their energy setup is more economically feasible now than it ever has been. In part because the technology is better, And manufacturing costs have been coming down, reliability is better, battery storage is better, and also because 
Many government incentives, including one in Alberta right now for agricultural producers, are available. The team at Kubi is experts in that. And you can find out about their solar energy solutions that can power your life at kubienergy.ca. A reminder that Kubi Energy presents Positive Reflections, the first show of every week. And that's an opportunity for you to tell us about random acts of kindness, things that filled your bucket, things that made your day. You can send those stories to us to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Also wanted to remind you, uh, we're doubling up on this because I'm super excited about the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra back together for the first time in a year and a half. It's their annual festival favorite, the Symphony Under the Sky at Edmonton's Horlack Park. From August 26th through September 5th, you can get tickets starting at $20 plus service fees. And children aged 17 and under, as long as they're accompanied by an adult, can sit in that beautiful grass seating area for free. You can love the classics. You can love the modern hits. The ESO takes them all on at Symphony Under the Sky. You can get your tickets at windspearcenter.com. Wanted to tell you about Grand Dog Essentials, quality raw food. Both of our dogs eat every single day Grand Dog Essentials quality raw food. What can I say more than that? They're our family members. If you have questions about how to transition your dog to a raw diet, raw food safety tips, or more, you can check out the blog feature under granddog.ca. It's also where you can place your order. If you use the promo code REALTALK, they'll give you 10% off your first-time order. They deliver to your door in Edmonton, Calgary, and Red Deer. Also, we're really excited to be partnering up. You know, there's a beautiful new uh, area of town. Have you heard of DeRoche Villages? You can check it out at DeRoche.community. Now, here's the deal. I'm just inviting you to mark your calendars because homecoming season is marching into DeRoche Villages coming up on September 11th, and I'm inviting you personally. I'm going to be hosting, along with my better half, Carrie Ann, a homecoming event to kick off the back to school and the CFL seasons with a bang. So you're going to have an opportunity to check out beautiful show homes by Daytona, Jamin, Landmark, and Pace Setter. There's going to be a tailgate party. I'm pretty good at those. And a whole bunch of you are going to have an opportunity to take your family or friends to an Edmonton Elks Calgary Stampeders game. Our Patreon supporters are going to have first crack at this. Check your emails on Sunday, and we'll have more details for you as September 11th approaches right here on Real Talk. You want to do a quick run through the Leap Manifesto before we go? Just a quick. Just, just a quick one. I know we've been on for two hours, 20 minutes, but let's just a real quick one. Just a real quick one. I don't know how one. you make a real quick you want to just take a real quick look at dramatically just, transforming everything that we know about just our a country? Quick gander. Not that, yeah, just a scan. You can check it out at leapmanifesto.org. This should not be perceived as an endorsement of the Leap Manifesto, <laughs> merely an exploration of what was released six years ago. Sam's doubling over right now. Do you remember it? Like, if you were put on the spot right now, would you be able to provide any specifics about it? I know I couldn't have. Well, I mean, it was maligned as being like, there's going to be no more pipelines. Like that was the headline that just kept getting hammered. Especially hammered, in Alberta, right? In Alberta when it came out. Yeah. it's uh, So, I mean, like I remember when it came out, I remember more just the, the fact, like you mentioned before, the NDP convention was in town and it was, you know, a hotly debated topic that was eventually defeated. And I mean, that is actually kind of... If you watch the chips fall, what led to Mulcair not being the leader of the party anymore as well. So, yeah. Let, let's take a look just at the bold text. Hoyles is like, are you serious right now? Respect the inherent rights and title of the original caretakers of this land. Indigenous communities fully implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So, Andre? I think right now you'd find consensus there. Mm -hmm. Not unanimous agreement, but I think that you could get that passed. The needle has definitely been moved. In a big way. Mm -hmm. There is no longer an excuse for building new infrastructure projects that lock us into increased extraction decades into the future. That's what they're talking about. That's the so-called no more pipelines. If you wouldn't want it in your backyard, says the Leap Manifesto, it doesn't belong in anyone's backyard. Indigenous people should be the first to receive public support for their own clean energy projects. So should communities dealing with heavy health impacts of polluting industrial activity. I think you'd find support for that. 
A universal program to build energy efficient homes and retrofit existing housing, ensuring that lowest income communities and neighborhoods will benefit first. Training and other resources for workers in carbon intensive jobs, ensuring they're fully able to take part in clean energy economy. Every party's promising that right now. High speed rail powered by renewables and affordable public transit. That's hardly extreme. Invest in decaying public infrastructure. I mean, that's a supercharged, huge, loaded conversation. We could do a week's worth of shows on that. Bike lanes. Oh, geez. Burr, oh, bike lanes. Oh, now you're going to start. Now you're going to start fights. <laughs> Moving to a far more localized. Uh, this show supports bike lanes. Moving to a far more localized and ecologically based agricultural system. Localized and ecologically based. Interesting. An end to trade deals that interfere with attempts to rebuild local economies, regulate corporations, and stop damaging extractive projects. I mean, that's a big one, too, right? As Christia Freeland renegotiated NAFTA with President Trump, that would have been an interesting one to talk about. Immigration status and full protection for all workers. We've talked about that on this show, haven't we? I mean, in the context of a pandemic in particular, but you could expand that conversation. Expand sectors of economy that are already low carbon. Caregiving. Who's talking about that right now? Teaching, social work, the arts, public interest media, and a national child care program is long past due, argues the Leap Manifesto. What are you laughing so hard at right now? It's just coming across to me as not as dramatic as it seemed six years ago. Yeah, I guess I'm finding it laughable that everyone was just like, (laughs) like Seth Klein said that people had their hair on fire. But if there's no perceived sense of emergency then a lot of it sounds like a big waste of money, right? An end to fossil fuel subsidies, financial transaction taxes, increased resource royalties. Ask Ed Stelmack how that worked out. Higher income taxes on corporations and the wealthy, a progressive carbon tax, cuts to military spending. I mean, that's it. They say then now is the time to leap. Now is the time for boldness. That's the leapmanifesto.org. You can read more about that. Interesting. I, you know what? If nothing else, we revisited that today. I, I've not read it for six years. Quite frankly, I've almost not thought about it for six years. Our thanks to Seth Klein for prompting that. That's a heck of a show. Have we solved all the world's problems today or not? So is I don't it time know. for me to tell you that we have another guest coming up? No, I'm just joking. You did have a bit of a sad development here as news develops live for fans of the rolling stones still not keith richards yeah i don't mean to be insensitive but he will never die keith richards he's immortal yeah uh charlie watts the drummer for the rolling stones died he was 80 years old yeah an unreal drummer thanks for making time for us today real talkers we appreciate you sticking around oh geez i see the live chats going nuts on bike lanes right now oils what have you done seems like a great time to sign off Coming up on tomorrow's show, we're going to continue our coverage of this federal election. We've got a lot of ground to cover there, and we know that it's important that the issues that matter to you are covered here. Plus, we'll take you out to the mountains for another edition of My Jasper Memories and so much more. In the meantime, please like, share, rate, review, tell everybody what you heard, and we'll talk to you soon.